This is Game On, discussing the biggest games and all the latest sports news with Johnny Montabano and Hank and Dichter on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Showtime, folks. It's episode 36 of Game On here on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. I'm Johnny Montabano, joined by Hank and Dichter and Nick Morgison for a very special show. We'll explain about that in just a couple of seconds. But guys, uh, Hank, first off to you. Welcome. How you doing? Doing pretty good. Uh, how about those Rangers? Big comeback victory over the hated New Jersey Devils at the Garden last night. Yeah, absolutely love to see it. And, folks, I told you not to start panicking over the Rangers too soon. You sure did. Absolutely, Hank. And Nick Morrison is with us today. Nick, good to see you. How you doing, bud? Oh, man, I'm doing good. Well, we'll see how we'll be doing after this show with all the news, but I'm yeah, good. Absolutely. It only seems fitting that, uh, you know, we've got another busy show. And uh, one of the reasons why we do have both of these guys on with us today is, um, well, this is going to be our last – uh, live game on for 2022 here. And as, uh, and you know what, these two guys have been a, a big reason why we've had uh, a lot of success here this year. You know, Nick and I started our first show back in March and then Hank came along the ways. He first came out as a guest. And then we made that announcement that he was going to be co-hosting with me. And uh, it's been, it's been a great first year of the show. I mean, of course we got a couple more months before we have the one year anniversary, but it's been a great 2022. And, you know, one thing that, tw- that every show this year has had is no shortage of topics. And yet again, that is the case. And that is one of the other reasons why we do have both of the guys on today. And I figured, you know what, it's only fair to have both of them on who have been a big reason why this show has been a uh, success so far. And here's to many, many more shows ahead. But like I said, you know, we've got a lot to get to here as we wrap up 2022. We've got certainly a lot of football, especially in the NFL. I mean, there's a lot of injury news. Uh, a lot to take from our two teams that we, that the three of us root for. We're going to get to that. We've got some NBA stuff. And then at the end of the show, we're going to look back at what was a moment that stuck out or even our favorite moments of 2022 in the sporting world. So definitely a lot to get to. But we do have to start the show on a serious note today. Um, some very, very sad news that broke uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, it happened Monday night, but it broke out Tuesday morning. Um, and that was... Uh, Mississippi State head football coach Mike Leach passing away at the age of 61 uh, from heart complications. Uh, Just, you know, as somebody who's a big college football guy like myself, I mean, I loved Mike Leach as a coach, and he was a tremendous guy. He was an amazing figure for the sport. I mean, if you watch, you know, the way he coaches, you know, his style, you know, his interviews, whether it's uh, during the game, at halftime, uh, after the game, you know, post-game locker room, I mean, all this stuff comes out, and then it was only a couple of days ago that the, we got the news that he was hospitalized for heart problems. And unfortunately it just kept taking a terrible turn. I mean, I went to bed on Monday night, uh, you know, was thinking about this and was hoping for the best, but it was bracing for the worst. And then about Tuesday morning, about eight thirty, nine o'clock Eastern or so we get the, the news from Mississippi state that he had passed away at the age of 61, just, uh, Terrible, terrible tragedy for not only just Mississippi State, for Hale State, for the Bulldogs, but really for the college football world. And, uh, guys, I'll open it up to you here first. Nick, I'll go to you here first to start. I mean, I know you guys aren't the biggest college football fans, but, I mean, I, you if you watch college football, I mean, you've heard of Mike Leach before, so you know him. But just the very, very um, awful news that broke this uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah, I mean – 61 years old, not old. He also had some entertaining moments with the media, which I thought was very interesting going back and forth. Um, You heard the news that he went in with a personal health issue. And when you hear personal health issue, you think it's not the worst thing. You think it's just something they have to go get checked out in the hospital. And then we hear the news that it took a turn for the worst. And unfortunately, now we're talking about it. (laughs) Unfortunately. 
Yeah, so you were you were right. I mean, on Sunday, the news released about the personal health issue, and he, he had told ESPN after this past regular season that he had struggled with pneumonia during the season. He was feeling better, and he was actually at practice on Saturday before suffering this latest health issue on Sunday. And the news of him falling gravely ill swept through the college football the last few days, um, and it really left it left a lot of us stunned. I mean, I know that. And just as the, the time was passing by here, it was this, the news was only getting worse and worse. And of course, you know, you were hoping for the best through all this. But uh, Hank, what did you what do you have to say about this? Yeah, definitely very sad. He was one of the more underrated coaches in uh, college football. And uh, Johnny, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the didn't Mississippi make a bowl game? Yeah, that's why they were they were practicing. That's what they were saying. So he was actually at practice. They were on Saturday, and that's when the news uh, broke that he had that personal health issue. And it's just sad that it's happened so quick. So yeah, the, now I don't know if um, they're this they're they're going to cancel their bowl game because of this. We don't know that just yet. But yeah, no, they were definitely were they, they should. Well, all I they know they should is cancel their bowl game. Yeah. If, if they play it, though, I wonder, like, what kind of tribute they're going to do for him before said game. Well, I mean, just think about this for a second in terms of football. Uh, I mean, I don't – I think Nick's right. I don't know how you can even think about playing I don't, right now. Yeah, right? no, I don't disagree. I mean, I mean, this is a big story. I mean, the man was around for – now, I I don't know his whole history. Like, I know he was a te- Texas Tech coach. And I know that he had a little bit of his run-ins with when he was with Texas Tech, some controversial stuff that went down at Texas Tech. I don't know the uh, Johnny. You would know this better than me, but mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say he was exactly the perfect person over the years. But he definitely was good at his job. We can't deny that. Oh yeah, I mean, I think he. What is he like? Hundred. He was uh, 150, 158 wins. For him, uh, and 107 losses in yeah, 21 no, season. Right, 21 seasons. Solid. 19 to 21 of those years, I think he made a bowl game. Uh, that's what it's going to show. And yeah, Mississippi State is scheduled to play Illinois in the ReliQuest Bowl on January the 2nd. And again, as of right now, we don't know if that game's going to still be on. I mean, I just am trying to think about this. Like, you know, we know what happened with the three Virginia football players that um, were killed and they canceled their final two games. I mean, it's a little bit different because uh, they were not bowl eligible at the time. And obviously at that point, football is not important. I mean, just that whole grieving aspect, which they're still doing there in Virginia. But uh, yeah, so they're scheduled to play on January the 2nd against Illinois in the ReliQuest Bowl. And again, we don't know if that's going to be the case, but yeah, no, Leach's, um, Leach's resume is very, very good. I mean, you know, when you think of college football, though, nowadays, I mean, you're, the first things you're thinking about are like the, the Nick Sabans, the uh, Dabo Sweeney's, and, you know, the, the Kirby Smarts of the world. But, I mean, Mike Leach was as cons- it was pretty consistent. As I said, 19 of 21 years in a, in a bowl game. I mean, that's a pretty good resume to have. I mean, I also looked at a statistic that his 158 career wins ranked fifth among active FBS coaches uh, this season. So, yeah, he's fifth highest in the FBS. I mean, think about it. When you only play 13 games at, at the bare minimum, 13 games a season in college, I mean, to make to win 158 games shows you like how consistent you have to be for how long, you know, how long, how consistent you have to be to have success. So really just, uh, you know, an awful story. And, you know, if you were, you go on Twitter uh, Tuesday and I'm sure as the days go on here, you see the tributes pouring in from, you know, fellow Nick coaches. Nick Saban had a really good one. Who's that? Nick Saban had a really good one. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, Saban's who's definitely coached against uh, Mississippi State a lot, a lot and uh, Mike Leach in his career a lot. Absolutely would know he that. Called, he called him an offensive eminate innovator who always did things his way said that his teams were well coached and extremely challenging to defend. They played with poise and toughness, which is a credit to his leadership. Tells you all you need to know. Yeah. And another thing that you could tell about how great a uh, head coach he is, is look at the, uh, the tree of coaches that have coached under with Leach, Lincoln Riley, 
just to name a few here, Lincoln Riley. Um, Lincoln Sonny Riley, Ray. and only Lincoln Riley, if you know what movie I'm referring to. I I don't. I'm not. A, see, I'm not that much. You've never seen my cousin Vinny. Oh, I, I mean, I've heard of it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I know just, what you're talking about. Hank. I'm just gonna put yeah. this out there. I am not the biggest movie buff in the world. Um, I could. I'll talk to you about sports. I'll talk to you about game shows and things like that till the end of time. But movies are not my thing. I think my cousin seen, Vinny though is a must. Okay. I think if I've seen ten movies in my lifetime, I'd be saying a lot. I'd be a lot. But just get back to this. So, yeah, Lincoln Riley yeah. uh, coach uh, was there. Uh, some of these other names you know of. Uh, Sonny Dykes, Cliff Kingsbury, Wes Welker is, an, is one of the assistants. I mean, the, there's a full list from Pete Thamel Wes on Welker. Twitter. What's that? Wes Welker is one of his assistants? Wow. I think it's a I – don't, I don't think it's that Wes Welker. I think it's a different – It's one. not the same one. It's not oh, the same one. Oh, okay. I was going to say, if I if Wes Welker was an assistant, how would I have, like, not known about that <laughs> Yeah, but and I, mean, I would have been living under a rock. Yeah, yeah, but just it's it's really and upon all, further review. Wes Welker is actually a Miami Dolphins wide receivers coach. Yes, that yes, that, that Wes the one that I'm thinking about. But I mean, the, just the you know, all the tributes that are pouring in here in the uh, hours, in the minutes and hours right after this news broke has just been um, just it's just it's sad, you know. He's only 61, you know, this day and age. You know, I don't know plenty of people that are up there in this in their sixties and stuff, and are doing great. So, just uh, an awful sixty is considered young. Absolutely, and you know, I'll just make a game show reference real quick here. You know, on Monday we were celebrating Bob Barker turning ninety nine, and he's still going strong. Knock on wood. Uh, hopefully, we're hoping he gets to a hundred. And by the way, speaking of movies, Happy Gilmore, of course. You know, I know that scene all too well. So, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's the that, best. and but. Uh, yeah, so the tributes are pouring in here, and again, like you guys are saying, we don't know right now what the status of their bowl game is going to be coming up here on January the second. It's obviously it's not important, but it would be, you know, a very emotional scene there if they do play and they are able to beat Illinois uh, in that ReliQuest Bowl happening on January the second. And that's the thing, you know, we were going to talk college football on the show because the Heisman Trophy was announced on Saturday the winner being Caleb Williams, the quarterback from USC, which I think was the right choice. And then, of course, you know, bowl season starting in general this week. You've got some bowl games like the Bahamas Bowl, uh, you know, the Fenway Bowl happening, the Las Vegas Bowl, just as the name starts. I mean, I'm looking forward to the end of the year because, you know, we're not going to be on before the uh, end of the bowl season. Uh, we'll, I'm probably going to do a Monty moment that last week of December to preview the two college football semifinals. But those are the two big ones. Obviously, Hank and I spoke about it briefly on the last show between Georgia and Ohio State, Michigan, TCU. I've got a great game to look forward to here on December the 30th, the Gator Bowl between my Notre Dame Fighting Irish and the South Carolina Gamecocks, where I'm going to be totally outnumbered, but that's that's quite all right. I'm used to that, whether it's here or on my on our football picks that we do. But, yeah, you know what? Now bowl season comes in. It's always fun. I mean, even if you have some of the – not – stellar matchups nevertheless it's still a bowl game and that's what they've been trying to do here but yeah so by the time we're back on again we're going to have our national championship matchup all set uh i think it's going to be michigan and georgia i think it's gonna be georgia and michigan one two uh, i i could see tcu making it kind of interesting because they've been playing close playoff game kind of playoff kind of football all year and i wonder how blake Corm's injury for michigan is going to affect them but i think Michigan's still just too good in too many ways. And, you know, what Har Jim Harbaugh has been able to do there over at Michigan has been just absolutely unbelievable these last couple of years. I know, Hank, you were talking about it too. And then as far as Georgia and Ohio State, Ohio State to me, I just don't think they have enough to get past that that talented Georgia defense, which is just so good and dominating. So I think it's going to be tough to see an upset in either of those two games, but we'll find out. The national championship game happens on January the 9th. We'll be on beforehand to talk about that. So, uh, and we'll do a much more of a deeper dive on that later on in the year. But let's uh, turn the page here, guys, and let's get to the NFL because, boy, there is a lot to look back on from week 14 in the league. And I, again, it's just amazing to think week 14, we have four weeks left in the regular season 15, 16, 17, and 18. That's crazy. 
it goes by quicker and quicker every year. And I don't know what it's been, but this year I think it's just been absolutely incredible. And I think part of that is because we've had just so much stuff to discuss. And that's what happens with these games. And really it starts right at the, the very first game of week 14 last Thursday, guys, the Vegas Raiders and the Los Angeles Rams. And when we were on last week previewing that game, we were thinking it was going to be Derek Carr against, gosh, maybe John Wolford. They were talking <laughs> about maybe using a Wolford and Pickens duo. And then out of nowhere, here comes the news that, boom, Baker Mayfield, who was put on waivers by the Panthers, and that's what we were talking about on the show. And then as the show is airing, the news breaks that the uh, Rams picked him up off of waivers. And I was like, oh, geez. But that's just life as it is. And, and, Baker and by the down. way, can we can we just say one thing? Just because Baker decided to throw for 230 yards and two touchdowns, can we can we just like pump the brakes a little bit? And like, because they were like, oh, should we pick him up in fantasy? Should we play him? Should we be no. a, like, come on, no. slow down. That's slow a bit down. Of a, I mean, it's a bit of a reach, but I think you also could say that it's a very cool moment for Mayfields, who two days prior to the game was not with a team. He was out of out of the league and out of a job. And then he goes there to the Rams and then leads them on a 98-yard touchdown drive to win the game against the Raiders. I mean, it's a cool kind of vindication moment for Mayfield. And I remember speaking of, you know, looking back at this year, Hank and I were talking when Baker was on that You Never Know podcast. And we kept talking about the only way that Mayfield was going to play in the NFL in 2022, or at least in my opinion, was going to be teams that were desperate. And at the time, the Carolina Panthers were desperate. The Los Angeles Rams were desperate. I mean, you're, you were playing John Wolford and Bryce Perkins there with also no, with pretty much no receivers and no defense. So you needed somebody in there, and he goes there and leads an unbelievable ride. And on the Raiders' side, it's another case of them blowing another 13-point lead. Hank, just an unbelievable thing there Thursday. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Baker is in a situation where he probably could succeed better with, like, more talent. So definitely a good get by the L.A. Rams. But do you know what the win that Baker Mayfield had for the Rams really confirms? Things were a mess with the Carolina Panthers up until they decided to fire. Um, at, well, not just fire, but give a boatload of severance pay. I can say to Matt, oh, Matt Rule. <laughs> you, you knew I was going to bring up the severance pay, did you not? Yes. But, but the one thing I want to say about Baker is Baker – He's really not going to be a starter in this league anymore. I mean, he that ship has kind of sailed. Now, there's two options. Actually, let me take that back. There's one place that I could see him starting, but it's not going to be exactly the most pleasant place to start. Now, would he rather be a starter in Houston as the Texans starter, or would he rather be the backup behind Matt Stafford and actually have a chance to be on a roster in L.A. that could win? Well, I'm going to throw something, and we're going to get through all these games, but if there's anything that we learned these last couple of weeks, you know, quarterbacks like Baker Mayfield, and I will even go to Cleveland and say Jacoby Brissett, are going to find jobs in the next year or two because look at all these quarterbacks that are going down. I don't think Houston's a possibility because Houston's going to draft a quarterback with the first overall pick. It's just going to be a matter of who. If it's going to be Bryce Young from Bama or C.J. Stroud from Ohio State, I think that's going to be the question mark. But if you look at all these injuries in with the quarterback position just this week alone, I mean, Kenny Pickett in concussion protocol yet again. Uh, you know, Lamar Jackson, who's who's still out. Tyler Huntley, who's out. Uh, Russell Wilson, I'm not saying Denver, but Russell Wilson concussed. Or Monday night, Kyler Murray. You know, if they find out that that is a torn ACL, it is the middle of December. He's not going to be back. By the start, if that is a torn ACL, he's not going to be back at the start of 2023. So, do you see maybe Mayfield getting a few weeks over there in in, uh, in Arizona? Well, if he has a torn ACL, he's going to be out more than a few weeks. But yeah, I mean, look at look. I mean, not to compare, but look at uh, Odell Beckham Jr. You know, he suffered in the Super Bowl, and they were thinking about him possibly being back in November, in November, December. And the Cowboys actually did the smart thing and realized that he probably was not going to be ready by then. Well, I'll give you a bold prediction, and actually I'm glad you brought up the Cowboys because this reference comes from it. I could see Jacoby Frissett remaining in a Browns uniform behind Deshaun Watson being paid $10 million a year 
like Kyle Orton was the backup for Tony Romo with Dallas. It was an insurance policy by Jerry Jones, even though Kyle Orton, I think, ended up playing at one point because Romo ended up getting hurt. But he, you didn't really see him. He was more there as the insurance policy. Now, that was an expensive insurance policy at $10 million. But I think Jacoby Brissett brings more to the table than Kyle Orton did as a backup in Dallas. So I could see them doing that. I really do. Yeah. And I also could see Jacoby Brissett starting on a team next year because he actually did an okay job with the Browns last this, this year. But I'm saying, hey, if, he, if he's going to be paid $10 million to sit as an insurance policy, I don't think he cares. No, that, that's that's fair. You know, money talks. But I think you're learning also in this NFL, and they were they – I was reading a stat Tuesday morning. I think they're up to like 60 quarterbacks that have played a snap this year. And just think about, you know, back in the day, the last couple of years, we were talking – like, you know, if you watch the Manning cast on Monday and you look at Peyton and Eli, Eli who – only missed one game because of the dumbest decision in the history of the Giants organization, or one of, if not the dumbest. And Peyton Manning, who really never got hurt. (sighs) Yeah. And Peyton Manning, who really didn't get hurt until, what, his 12th year with the neck? You just don't see that. You don't see this kind of durability in the NFL for whatever reason. Wait a minute. Broncos country, let's ride, too. Another one, yeah. (laughs) And look at that possibility, too. But just that was that was crazy, you know, and this speaks to the volume of the NFL this year. Here's Baker Mayfield, who 48 hours before he takes a, the snap mm-hmm. uh, is without a team, and then uh, who who thought he was going to be ready for Thursday night football? Learning the playbook in two days. I, Hank, I'm not going to put my hand up. <laughs> I, I am going to put my hand up and say it. Say it. Put your hand down. I'm lying. <laughs> so yeah so uh yeah there's no way and but i will say this and i'm not gonna lie when i say this and obviously we make our pick we make our thursday picks here on the show i might have gone in a little bit of a different direction if i knew that baker had a chance to play because i still think he would have given you a little bit something more than bryce perkins and john wolford would have I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I would have thought the Rams would have won that game, but I think Hold it was a, a six and a half. Timeout. I what? forgot my phone was in my pocket. Let me just do a little strategy. I told you I was going to do before the show. There we go. Boom. <laughs> 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 but, I just wanted to be dramatic and throw it across the room, but uh, you're <laughs> good. And also do it without breaking it. Yes, <laughs> but. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I would have taken the Rams to win, but I thought they would have at least made it more interesting with Baker. But I think it also just speaks to Josh McDaniels. We've and we've spoken about him on the show before too. He's a he is not a good he's not a good head coach, and maybe that's a sign that you know what maybe maybe they needed a change over there in Vegas again. And can we stop calling him uh, the offensive genius? I'm getting tired of that. Offensive genius. I mean. This is the same guy who, when he was with the Broncos, lost the game by a score of like 59 14. By the way, uh, pop quiz who beat them in that game? 59 14. Or... I don't remember. I don't know. The Raiders in 2010. Wow. wow. And the Raiders, who offense was actually playing better this year. So I would have told you that, but. Interesting. Okay. Well, on this quarterback discussion, it seems like it's going to be a theme this week, and that gets us to game number two of the week, and that was Nick's Jets taking on the Bills. And, boy, I'll tell you, I mean, if there's any, like, indication about Mike White, I mean, the amount of hits that he took on Sunday was unbelievable. And just the determination that he had going back out there in that cold weather where it was raining and then you had some wintry mix and you had a little bit of snow and you had the wind blowing and the, the hits that he took. I mean, I was, I was scared for his life there, Nick, but I mean, excuse the pun, but it was a winter wonderland out there. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and you know, the jets defense, I mean, this is what I was talking about on, on last Friday when we did our football pick segment. I thought that this was going to be kind of a low scoring game. And I thought they actually had a, de- a, a chance going into this one, but uh, the Mike White injury, unfortunately, looks like he's going to be okay. It looks like Quinn and Williams, who did leave this game also, is, is going to be all right too, which I think is very, very important. But, Nick, I'll throw this out to you as we look ahead also real quick. 
given Mike White's situation and the fact that he may not be 100% going into Sunday against the Lions, do you think maybe they have just have to go with maybe dress a third quarterback and have Zach Wilson ready on standby? You have no choice. You need to have a backup quarterback in an emergency. You can't play with one quarterback. Now, is it the quarterback I really want to see on the field? No, but Joe Flacco is going to get the start. Now, I, I'm going to question this a million times over, and I said this in our chat. Where was the flag on those two hits? At real On real time, given how the history of the league's been with roughing the passer and stuff, I was a little surprised there was not one. I mean, he got hit in the ribs twice. Usually, those are usually penalties. And especially when you saw the kind of roughing the passer that happened in the Dolphins-Chargers game on Sunday night. But, uh, Hank, we all know how you feel about Joe Flacco, your nickname that he gave him. I'll say this. <laughs> I say that, nickname. that was um, – no, that was coined when, like, he had that massive – that deep throw that, like, the yes. defender oh, caught, was... like, as if it was a punt. Hence the nickname – <laughs> the arm pun, and that's actually a nickname I would give more credit to urinating tree for. <laughs> but I'm going to disagree with with Nick here, and he's not going to like to hear this. Now it looks like Mike White is in law is is trending towards playing, but if he cannot go on Sunday, to me Zach Wilson's is got to start. You cannot start Joe Flacco in in the league. I mean, he's been the backup. I mean, he gives. To me, I mean, I think Wilson's got to be. I think he's got to be active, and I think that if he's if if White's not going to play, I think it's a win win spot for the Jets if Zach does start because you 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 figure out if he can give you something, or you know if he goes out there and lays another dud. To me, then you know he's not the answer, but he cannot be active and not start Sunday. Well, he could be the backup. I mean, I, I just think that's his status that he's earned at this point. He can't throw the football. He can't run the football. He can't do anything correctly. Why would you start him? Well, I if you know what, if I had the choice, I would still rather deal with him than I would with Flacco. And this is a, if White doesn't play Sunday. We don't know if that's the case. I mean, you had Salah saying that uh, he's day-to-day -day right now. Uh, do, you, do you trust anything Salah says at this point? No, because I don't trust the fact that he thinks that the Jets and the Bills are going to play each other again uh, later on this year. Oh, I, I didn't even hear him say that. He said no. He said that we will see the, uh, that he thinks we're going to see the Bills again later this year. Yeah, good luck with that. And I'm and I'm going to be a billion dollars richer tomorrow. <laughs> well, it was not a good day Sunday for the Jets because the fact that they lost and you had both the Chargers and the uh, the Patriots winning this week was not was not good. But uh, Hank, what did you, what do you think? Um, yeah, no, I think that I would definitely rather have Zach Wilson start if you cannot start Mike White. Nick, don't kill me. I know what you're going to think. You're, I see that look in your eyes, but come on, let's be honest. Do you, do we really want a washed up at this point, Joe Flacco starting? Is that really your best resort? And I mean, look, I can get behind punishing Zach Wilson, at least for a game, by not having him dress. But for but if you're gonna go beyond that and then you know practically like screw with his head even more. I mean, look, I'm not saying I agree with what Zach Wilson did. Okay, let's be honest. He shouldn't have said that to the media. You can't. You got to be careful with how you handle a young quarterback who's only had like I don't know what twenty starts, something like that. Career. Yeah. Like I'm sorry, but. You look look at a lot of these quarterbacks in the league. You got to be careful with how you handle them. So, I think at the very least, you should have had him sit on the bench, have him learn his lesson, then come back and see. Oh, okay, I'm going to be a backup, but you know, maybe I'll get my chance. Now, I'm not disagreeing with you. You cannot, in good conscience, go with an aging arm punt. <laughs> now, I'm not disagreeing. He needs to dress because they need a backup quarterback. Regardless if he starts or if Flacco starts and he goes down, because we've seen him get hurt before, even coming in in the backup resort. So he is going to be in a uniform one way or the other because they have no choice. But I don't know. I, I just I think the ship has sailed, so to speak, on Zach Wilson. Interesting thing the Jets have right now these next two weeks is you're going up against a Lions team that's playing great, and you're going up against a, a 
a Jaguars team that's also playing great right now. So they're probably getting these two game, these two teams at the worst possible time when now you're in a situation where now you've got to win and get some help to get back into the playoff discussion. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence right now. A couple of weeks ago, I said the Jets will make it. Now I'm on the fence on whether they'll make the playoffs right now. Well, it's funny because these two weeks were probably weeks that you were – I mean, I'm, I'm not going to speak for you, but I would imagine you were probably kind of confident in given the way that the Jets are, were playing and the way the Lions were five weeks ago. But all of a sudden now the the, the Lions are playing great. I know we're going to get to them in a, in, a, in a second here, but, you know, the Lions are playing great and you saw what the Jags did against the, the, the Titans. Now all of a sudden these two games have become very, very uh, critical, especially when you still got to go to Seattle and to Miami at the end of the year. But we'll we'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. But you had that. You had the Bengals getting past the Browns, twenty three to ten. There were some injury woes there for the uh, Bengals, though. Afterwards, you know, Bo, Matt uh, Boyd, Tyler Boyd got hurt. T. Higgins got hurt. I mean, those are two big receivers for Joe Burrow to go along with uh, Jamar Chase, and we don't know their status going into this weekend just yet. But if those, those guys, guys are down, they're not winning games. I'm just telling you that now. Yeah, um, we'll f- we'll find out as the week goes on here before we do our football picks later on in the week. Uh, Cowboys just get past the Texans t- uh, late in the fourth quarter there, 27-23. Boy, I'll tell you, and this uh, – I, I mean, I, I agree with what the, the, the Texans did at the end there when they were up 23-20, had a chance to either kick a field goal or go for it. I'd say, look, you're a one-win team. you got nothing to lose. You go for it there and try and put the game away. But, I mean, it was – Davis Mills, Jeff Driscoll. I mean, God, they're so they're so bad. And I don't know though, guys. To me, I know that what is that? That's the tenth win for the Cowboys, but they still have a, they still have a lot of flaws too. Even though they're they're wrecked, despite their record. Did you see who they signed? Yeah, so they did sign a um, a blue Tank a guy who, Driscoll almost almost uh, making America happy by getting the upset of the near century. But oh yeah, I mean there were seventeen and a half point dogs entering that one. But yeah, so the so the the Cowboys should be happy because they did sign a, a player who wears who wore number thirteen, who did wear a blue and white uniform, but it was not OBJ. It was uh, Ty Hill. Uh, who was it? Ty uh, T Y Hilton. T Y Hilton. I said Ty, I combined both of his initials. Uh, T Y Hilton to a contract. Yeah, I you know they need they the Cowboys need help. That's what they need. I, I don't know what T Y Hilton's going to give you give you, but it's going to give you another option receiving. Right. Much. I mean, they needed help in the worst way in the wide receiver position. Now, we'll see if sitting around and not getting any reps is going to hurt, but I think having the veteran experience helps. Yeah, and kind of a sneaky game on Sunday. They go down to Jacksonville to take on the Jaguars to the Cowboys. Uh, we talked about the, how about those Lions getting past the uh, the, the Vikings – Another good game for Jared Goff. And I tell you, look at this Lions team, guys, and I brought it up during our football picks last week. They have a favorable way down the stretch here to get themselves into playoff discussion, given their schedule and given everybody else's teams and the way that they're playing right now. I mean, it's there for them. I mean, Kirk Cousins throwing for 425 yards and not winning. That that That's all you got to say. Well, it's, yeah, and Hank, it's also the fact that the Vikings gave up 400-plus yards again. And it's the fact that five straight, five, five straight, straight games. And, you know, I know how Nick loves to talk about Vegas during our football Friday picks. I don't think Vegas is in love with the Vikings because this was the second time in three weeks that they were an actual underdog to a team that record wise was. And uh, some distinguished co-host of mine, I believe he's in the one square below me and Nick. I think he was the Lone Ranger in calling the Lions. He was, yeah, he yeah, was. And you know, guys, I just I look at this I look at this Lions team, and their offensive line has been playing great. You know what? Their receivers have been very, very good, and very quietly, their defense. Now I know they gave up a bunch of yardage last week, but their defense has has been playing very, very well here these last few weeks. It really. You know, we saw that with the, when Hank. We saw that when the Giants were were playing them. You know, their defense is is suffocating, and they have receivers that are pretty good. You know, uh, DJ Shark. We obviously know about Amon Ross St. Brown, who's been putting up some great numbers these last few weeks. Uh, you know, they just got their first round draft pick uh, Williams back. Uh, he had, remember he had hurt himself in Alabama when they drafted him, and he was going to miss the start of the year. And they have right now the best the best scoring running back 
in Williams as well. He's got like 14 uh, rushing touchdowns. In the red zone. In the red red zone. zone. I mean, that's – so they're definitely building something there, and they're they're a team to watch out for, especially when you look at their schedule the rest of the way. I mean, they've got the Jets this Sunday. They've got the Panthers. They've got uh, Green Bay, and I think they've got Chicago too. I mean, at the bare minimum, that's a two-and-two. They're all winnable games, actually. They are, and I hate to say this, I don't. I I think the Jets are not playing them at a good time. I mean, the people want to tell me, oh, but it's going to be outdoors. Well, we saw that a few weeks ago. They were at MetLife Stadium. Outdoors doesn't mean anything. It's cold in that game. It is going to be cold. That is true. But you know, they were at MetLife Stadium a few weeks ago, and they absolutely put a beating on the Giants. So outdoors in football, I feel like doesn't mean anything unless you're going from a warm, like Tampa. If Tampa were to come to New York. That's the only way I feel like it would make a difference because you're going from 80 degrees to 20. But that could be, you know what? That could be the Dolphins going to Buffalo on Saturday night. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that's going to be insane. I think Tua is going to struggle. I'm, I'm worried about him, and we'll get to that game on set on uh, this Friday for sure. So, yeah, it's a big win for the Lions now. And I think they're actually in pretty favorable position here as long as they do their part. And that brings us to, unfortunately, Hank. I know you were you went to MetLife Stadium Sunday for the Eagles and the Giants, and it's just look. His, this is just what it comes down to, and I would have said this if no matter what the score was, or if the Giants had even won this game. You know, this really, when you look at this game, in my opinion, this really was not an important game for the Giants to win. Even if they had won this game, they still have to. Sunday's the game of the year for them I mean, against the Commanders. But I think what this game just shows you, the the Eagles are just too good, and you know what I mean. I don't think the Giants are this bad. I think t- talent-wise, they're missing some guys, but I don't think they're this bad. I think the Eagles are just that good, and they clinched the they clinched the playoff spot with that win on Sunday. But Hank, you were at the game, and I'm curious because I was watching it at the bar, and I had noticed they were scrolling they were scrolling around the stadium a lot. You saw a lot of Philly green there. Was it as bad as as it uh, looked on TV? Oh, it was absolutely disgusting. I saw way too many green, and Johnny. You didn't even mention the worst part, and actually, that's because you weren't there. So, I am going to tell you the worst part. So, I unfortunately could not drive to the game because I had like I had a flat tire, and then it turned out when I got my car fixed yesterday, one of my wheels had a nail in it. So I had to get, oh, I had to get not one but two tires replaced. But fortunately, I was still able to make the Rangers game yesterday and thankfully that one was a much more successful comeback win but back to the giants yeah so i can't drive i i'm meeting up with my buddy at a penn station i took the train to grand central made the walk to penn and then as i get to penn i pretty much have to do this caucus shuffle which for those of you watching and don't know you basically have to get on a train to new jersey transit get off at secaucus and transfer and then get to metlife now you see why I drive to games, even though that drive is kind of a pain in the ass, too. <laughs> so anyways, as I get off the train, I hear the worst sound I've ever heard. And it's probably even more annoying than the sound that Jim Carrey made in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I get off the train and I hear the stupid E-A-D-L-E-S Eagles. Oh, God. And, I, I've, I... and I'm just like. Oh my gosh, a whole car filled with Philly fans. And I practically like, (laughs) it was just so cringeworthy. And like you go inside the stadium, it's like half the people there are blue. Half of them are in green. Although then again, I would imagine probably a lot of season ticket holders who knew that this game was probably going to be a blot just figured, Oh, I'm going to get rid of my tickets. By the way, if you're a giant fan who sold your tickets to an Eagles fan, you deserve maybe a lump of coal in your stocking. <laughs> so, do you know how vile that fan base is? Like, come on now. The, there's a reason why I think of this rivalry as just as much associated with uh, North and South Jersey as, say, New York and Philadelphia, or should I say maybe the battle between the Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire? <laughs> By the way, did you hear Fly Eagles Fly? Oh, yeah. I heard that song way too many times. It was just... And, and and like I said, I don't remember it being this bad when I went to the that certain game that we shall not talk about that happened on December nineteenth, twenty ten. But the the amount of Eagles fans that I just saw, it, 
it was pretty bad. But hopefully, if I decide to make the trip up to Philadelphia this weekend for Ranger Flyers, we'll see a blue invasion. So maybe we get our revenge. <laughs> but by the way, that game was insane. I, I think oh, Jaylen- as far as the game itself, like I was like briefly hanging out at a tailgate beforehand. Had a had a few burgers and dogs. Really good food, by the way. And I go inside. I get to my seat. Eagles are driving, and they it made, it made it seem like they were like taking candy from a baby when they scored that first touchdown. Yeah. And then, not to mention, you knew the game was over. Fourth and seven. Julian Love tries to make that big play. Easy path to the end zone for Devonte Smith and. I probably should have just gone back on the train immediately after that happens. I mean, for first of all, if you're Julian Love, why are you trying to intercept and bat that ball down? I mean, it's geez. fourth and seven. You're gonna get the ball back. Yeah, I mean, an interception there. You get it. I mean, it's, it's, you're better off batting it down because you get in a better position anyway. I mean, I, I, you know what? I guess it's just a defensive player's mind to always intercept the ball. I mean, you know what? It's just in your mind. And by the way, the Giants were lucky that they even got their points, anyways. Can I? Can we be honest about that too? Because that the only way the reason they got that touchdown was because of the whole fake punt controversy, and they had really good field position. And then the other two touchdowns, like the Eagles were like, "Ah, oh, we we have a big enough lead. We can just sit on it." Yeah. No, By the I, way, do you want to know a not so fun fact? Okay. Sure. Richie James was one of the leading receivers for the Giants. All of those yards came in garbage time. He had oh minus my god yards in the first half. Well, I, in yeah. other words, you you had more receiving yards. You had more receiving yards. I had more receiving yards in the first half than Richie James. Well, I think there was one stat. It might have been, I think, on their on the Eagles' first drive or their second drive, that Jalen Hurts completed a pass to seven different receivers. And their seventh receiver was probably better than the Giants' number one or two receiver. That's That was one of my biggest concerns going into this game was just the talent discrepancy between these two teams. I mean, the Eagles are so deep, and the Giants, who are not really that deep to begin with, have been suffering injury woes these last couple of weeks. And it's just problematic. I mean, they're, they're, they are literally like limping to the finish line here in so many ways, shape, or forms. Nick, I know you wanted to say something, so go ahead. No, I was just going to say, looking at this game, It first of all, for Jalen Hurts to only have 217 yards and them to put up 48 points is incredible, too. That just shows you how great the team is around him. Yeah, and the rushing attack, too, which did it again. Yeah, I mean, Miles Sanders, 144 yards. A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts making the connection again on another touchdown. Yep. It's like you said, they're just the better team. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's that's what it just comes down to. And, you know, I mean, here's – and I want to say this one thing too, and I know this is this is very easy to, to say afterwards. I would not have played Barkley uh, Sunday. You know, I mean, now we, we were talking about him with his neck problems and stuff, but to me there was just too much more risk than reward with playing him. And to me it looked like uh, Brita and Bridewell had better runs – than Barkley, that they looked more explosive. I think you saw that one. I think it was from Bridewell, Hank, that he ran up the middle for first down. That looked more explosive than Barkley. And I know the prior three weeks between with the Lions, the Cowboys, and the Commanders that they were very, very good defenses. But and that's been a problem with Barkley. He's running against some superior defense, but he just does not look right. I mean, it's almost like he's more comfortable catching the ball out of the back, out of the uh, out of the backfield, and running it up that way. And oh no, Tom get... and I just dis- discussed this on Big Blue Avenue numerous times. Like, is it true that you know the offensive line has been banged up and thus maybe Saquon hasn't been as productive as he's been over the first half of the season? Yes, but at the same time, he clearly has not been right for the past few weeks. Both can be true. Both yeah. can be true. <laughs> I, you love you love that new catchphrase of mine. I Absolutely. do. I think we're going to put that as a graphic for next year. But um, yeah, no, I I think, um, and also I think maybe you're you're going to have to start to rethink the idea of giving out bank to Saquon Barkley. And generally speaking, as much as I like Saquon Barkley, you do not give bank like that to a running back. You know how? Do you know how many running backs last too long in the NFL? Not many. No. Oh. You want it? I, I read a stat a couple of years ago. Do you know what the average career of a running back is? Like 
five years? Three, four years, something like that. Three to four years? Three years. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I, you know, a perfect example of that, too, is Jonathan Taylor in the, in, mm-hmm. in, with the Colts. I mean, he had a dynamite rookie year last year, and this year he's been dealing with, with ankle problems for a couple of weeks, and his production's been down, and there's no coincidence that the Colts have also been down for a myriad of reasons. But him not being the explosive guy that he was last year has been – a big factor that too, but yeah, I agree with you. You know, I don't want to talk about the off season with the giants, but to me, I think Daniel Jones should come back. And to me, the only way I think I see Barkley coming back is if they franchise him. I, and I don't know what the franchise tag is for running backs, mm-hmm. but uh, do they have the, that money? Well, they're going to have, there's going to be some contracts that come off them this year. And I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because I said that I would not put all my, my eggs in one basket for Odell Beckham. So depending on what that salary cap, the, uh, the franchise tag is for running back, that's the only way I could see Barkley coming back here. Cause I can't give him an extension because Nick, you had said it too, you know, with the, the life average lifespan of a running back. And I can go out there and get a running, a sign of, running back. And we saw it last year. The Giants' best running back last year was their backup, who they couldn't sign back for $3 million this year. And even it looked like Bridewell and Breda were were better, were more explosive against the Eagles on Sunday. It's rare that you run into a guy like, say, a Frank Gore, who who managed to keep his body, uh, keep him in, in shape and stay on the field. like that. Uh, and that was what, he's like the second or third all-time in, in rushing yards. But that's rare that you see a guy, a running back, last 10 to 12 years like he did. Yeah, and if you want to say the same thing about McCaffrey, he's had down years the last few years now. And, you know, he's gone to a good organization there with the 49ers that has multiple options. I mean, not right now, but that's what they have there. It'll be interesting, though. He might be having to get used more in these next couple of weeks. And, no, that is not the Giants GM calling to say, I know how I can fix the team. But, <laughs> yeah, but that's what it comes down to, guys. I mean, next Sunday, I mean, it's just plain and simple. Next Sunday is pretty much a very telltale sign of where the Giants' season is going to be, I think. I still trust him to make decisions more so than the good old – his good old predecessor. <laughs> I, I agree. But, you know, I think they had, they had some more options, though, before and you saw Bellinger get hurt again, which is not a good thing. And there's also, you know, ever since Evan Neal got hurt, I know he's come back, but ever since Evan Neal went down, the uh, the old line's not been the same. Look, injuries are going to happen. We're seeing that everywhere in the league, but there are only you're only going to take it as, as far as your talent takes you with the Giants. But we'll find out here. There's still a way, and they're still in position. I mean, what helped too was Carolina beating the, the uh, Seahawks, and we're going to get to that. But speaking of, you know, injuries, it, again, it's a theme here. We saw it in the Raven Steelers game where both quarterbacks, Tyler Huntley, Kenny Pickett, both left the game, both were put in concussion protocol. And that meant that for the Steelers, you went to, Oh God, Kenny Pickett. And I, as somebody who took the Steelers, when I saw Kenny Pickett was in there, I threw my pick in the, in the trash. Cause I knew I was done. Three interceptions looked awful, but for the Ravens here, very critical thing here, because if Huntley's not going to be able to play, remember they got a short week this week. They play the Browns on Saturday and if he doesn't clear protocol and we know Lamar Jackson's still out, they're going to be going to third stringer Anthony Brown to start against the the Browns on uh, Saturday. And the Baltimore will be saying, well, what can Brown do for you against the Browns? I mean, the best way to put this quarterback situation, <laughs> I mean, because that's what it is right now. Um I like Tyler Huntley. Obviously, if he's in concussion protocol, he's definitely not clearing that on a short week. Let's just admit that now before we go down that rabbit hole of despair. Um, and Lamar is Lamar. He's going to be... They said it could be anywhere from one to four weeks, which is basically the end of the season. Um, by the way, I know hot take. I would not give him the money at the end of the season if I were the Ravens. I would, mm-hmm. I'd be totally fine if they wanted to start Tyler Huntley going on in the future. Uh, Kenny Pickett, I just don't trust. I, like he keeps getting hurt. He keeps getting hurt. What is this? Like his third time in concussion protocol? It's at least his second, and that's and, problematic. It's problematic because one, he can't brace himself when he gets hit, or he can't get out of the pocket and throw the ball away. That's why he's getting hurt and getting hit. Yeah, and Najee Harris has not been. Speaking of running backs, you know Najee Harris has not been that great this year. And that's a pro, and that's a that's a concern. You know, if you're not if your running back's not going to give you much, it's going to force you to be throwing the ball, and it means you might be taking more shots. 
I mean, when you don't leave the park and you have cement feet, you're going to get hurt. Yeah, that wasn't looking good there, too. You know, Trevor Lawrence was a guy who also was uh, dealing with a toe issue in practice last week. We didn't know if he was going to clear, uh, if he was going to play Sunday against the Titans. Well, he sure did, and he looked and he looked the best he had looked in his entire career. Uh, it was unbelievable the some of the throws. I mean, he had over 300 yards passing by the third quarter against the Titans. And now Tennessee's running into problems, too, ever since they fired John Robinson. Uh, Jacksonville wins 36-22. to And this is the concern, Nick, that I have with your Jets, who play the Jaguars in two weeks. Might be getting them at a hot time. See, I have a lot of concerns with the Titans. I think I brought this up with both of you a couple weeks ago. That How many years ago was it that they were the number one overall seed uh, in the playoffs? It was, I think it was two two years. And they got bounced in the first round, if I'm not mistaken? Right. Now, last year they got bounced by the Bengals, and that was with uh, Tannehill throwing all those interceptions and Derrick Henry not being like himself. Actually, didn't they get bounced by the Broncos as the number one overall seed? Uh, I would have to go back and check that. I mean, it, it sounds about right. By the way, that would be totally ironic if that was the case. But, yeah, I'm concerned with the Titans. They have one option. That's it. That's all they have. Derrick Henry. They don't have anybody else. Um, oh, they got they lost to the Ravens. Uh, oh, was it the 20, Ravens? That was in twenty twenty in the wild card round, twenty to thirteen. But but we've said this many times. Derrick Henry can't be your your only offensive option. Well, you've got Robert Woods, but he hasn't given you much. And uh, their first round pick, Traylon Burks, has been in and out of the out of the lineup this season too. Yeah, there, there's no victory here. Like I don't see the Titans going far again. Call me crazy, but I don't think they're going far. No, it's it's hard to say that. I mean, if if, if you know if everybody knows you're going to be going to Henry, and then that you're you're going to force Tannehill to be throwing the ball a lot, I mean, that's where you, that's where you start getting nervous with with Tannehill again. Right. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, a big win there for Jackson. Uh, for I'm sorry, yeah, for Jacksonville, and then the Chiefs against the Broncos. And boy, this looked like a <laughs> lock early on. What was it, twenty-seven to nothing, uh, early in the second quarter, twenty-eight nothing, even. Yep. And, and, uh, but. You know what, Patrick Mahomes uh, didn't look like himself in this game. Through three interceptions, and of course, you know, speaking of injuries, let's bring it up again. Another one here. Russell Wilson left the game with a concussion in the second half in their lo- in the loss, and that means that it could be Brett Rippon starting for the Broncos next week. I mean, I mean. Okay, I, I won't waste that all now because it's not the uh, same show. But that's, yes, that's one of the reasons why we're going to have everybody back again next week for the football picks, just so we can see. Well, we can't really use that graphic because maybe uh, Russell's not going to clear protocol by then. But I mean, it's the Broncos. Broncos I, country, let's ride. But yeah, I mean, I mean, if he's if he's out of the concussion protocol, they're definitely not winning next week. I'll tell you that now. Uh, boy, let's see here. Who they got here in, that, in week fifteen? But does it really matter at this point? <laughs> I guess it would be maybe the Texans. They might have a chance, but no, they're um, – let's, let's see. But uh, It can't be good. <laughs> well, oh, that's right. It could be a battle of backups because they are, take, they are home to take on the, the Cardinals. Oh, God. <laughs> and we're going to get to the Cardinals in a minute here, but uh, Hank, I'll go to you first for this one because this was a very this this game I, when we did the picks was one of the ones I struggled with a lot, and that was the Panthers and the Seahawks up there in Seattle. And I tell you what, Steve Wilkes and Sam Darnold have given the Panthers life here as they win thirty to twenty four, and. You know, the Panthers now are right there in the NFC South discussion. Isn't that amazing, Susan? And uh, wouldn't it be something if the if the Panthers found a way to win that division? Like, can you imagine Steve Wilkes with the job that he's done, given the circumstances? And it's funny, not, not too long before, Johnny, you and I talked about the Panthers and were on record as calling them the worst team in the league. And... I still stand by it like what we said at the time because, I mean, they they were an utter mess. But, you know, 
maybe Sam Darnold finally is playing under a system that suits him. I mean, I don't think he ever was really untalented, so to speak. I mean, Nick, no offense, but let's be real. We know that your Jets pretty much ruined him as they've done. Oh, no, I'm not disputing that by any means, but he didn't help himself either when he was with the Jets organization. No, 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 of course not. I mean, the seeing ghosts comment definitely hurt. Oh, yeah, that was bad. But I, I will give it to you that once he left the organization, he had a better chance to succeed. Maybe maybe he's getting that chance with the Panthers right now, but then again, maybe not because time will tell. Maybe Wilkes gets exposed as a bad coach, but it is nice to see him succeeding after that one year he coached the Cardinals and then he got fired. And really, if you look at the situation, that was, I don't, I wouldn't have gotten rid of him after that one year, but that's especially considering you replaced him with kick Cliff Kingsbury, who might actually be even worse. Right. That was a big running attack for these, for the Panthers too. You know, Deontay Foreman, 21 carries for 74 yards. Chubba Hubbard, 14 carries, 74 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Sam Darnold was 14 of 24 for 120 and one score. But guys, also at the same time here, you look at the Seahawks now, and they've they're starting to struggle a little bit here. Geno Smith threw two did throw for three touchdowns, but two interceptions. <laughs> and Seattle's now running into problems here as they fall to seven and six. And I mean it was good, it was a good day for our Giants in that regard. But Seattle now seems to be going in the wrong direction. And that's what I had said last week that got me concerned about this game from their perspective was the fact that they are starting to hit a bit of a, a slide here and that Carolina has been playing with some confidence. And if things go right, you know, you look at next week, you've got a big NFC South matchup. You've got the Bucks playing the Bengals. And why would you think the Bucks are going to win that? Unless the Bengals are going to not have Boyd and or Higgins. I, I Carolina's got a chance here. I mean, it's not crazy to say that. I mean, it's, it, it they definitely do have a chance. I think this is a classic situation of Seattle's running out of gas. I I really do. I just I Gino's been a good story. He will be the back uh the comeback player of the year. I think that's a given. Right. But I think they're just out of gas. I think it's they had a big task in front of them. And no one thought they were gonna win this many games either. No, I had them at I think between three and five. I mean, they're at seven. So <laughs> now here's the here's the thing, though, Nick. And you were talking about them running out of gas. They come right back around and play Thursday to start Week 15. They play. They are home to take on those 49ers. Actually, listen to this schedule for the the, the Seahawks. And this is where I think if you're the Giants, you can breathe a little bit of a breathing room. But look, listen to the schedule. For, home to take on the 49ers, and then they are at Kansas City home to take on the Jets, which I don't think is going to be that easy. And then they take on the Rams. And the Rams right now, who knows? But, I mean, that's – you have the 49ers and the Chiefs back-to-back weeks here. I mean, I would say the Rams are a wild card, so I'd throw that game to the side. But the other three, hard. Really yeah. hard. And, I, and you huh. know, even though the Jets have to go to, uh, to Seattle, I mean, the 12th, man, that's not – you know, that's not a lock like it's been in years past. No, not at all. Although it could be the Geno Smith revenge game in that spot when you if you look at it, Geno <laughs> against the Jets. That uh, quote was so dumb in uh, in the post game. Oh, uh, I, I'm going to hold them accountable. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, win, win, win a Super Bowl, win a playoff game first. Yeah. Now let me look at Carolina's schedule here, real quick. They got their home to take on the Steelers on Sunday, which dare I say could be against Mitch Trubisky. <laughs> and then, then they're home to take on Detroit, which, you know what, the way the Lions are playing, that's not going to be easy. And then they go to Tampa and to New Orleans. And that, and that's critical because if you look at Carolina in division, they've done all right in division. You know, they already have a win against Tampa, and they have a win against New Orleans already. So this could be a spot. It could come down to, you know, divisional tiebreakers. You go look at the divisional records, and Carolina might have a little bit of a slight advantage in that regard. Mm-hmm. Right. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, speaking of those Bucks, though, absolutely destroyed at the hands of the 49ers, 35-7. Now, you did have a couple of injury woes here with the Niners. Debo Samuel, which the Niners may have caught a break on because it looked like it could have been a season-ending injury. They're now expecting possibly him back in the regular season. Brock Purdy, 
who's become Mr. Relevant instead of irrelevant. Uh, Hurt is oblique. He's currently day-to-day, but there's a situation, quick turnaround again for uh, the 49ers on Thursday. But to me, I think the 49ers have enough where they can survive the quarterback situation here with the running backs and the receivers they have. Now, the Debo injury, though, I mean, that's another thing too. So what, what do you, Hank, what do you got? What do you make of this? Debo Samuel. I think they could have definitely dodged a bullet there because Debo is one of their better weapons and hold on. <laughs> oh, excuse me. No. <laughs> oh, no. I Bless swear. I'm not allergic to the 49ers, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Obviously, I'm not allergic because I've like been on record saying that they were good, but I think they might be the ones that are allergic to staying healthy. But in any event, I would say Brock Purdy being day to day. That's also kind of a oh god, not again. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm, it's too late. For the blooper, <laughs> Hank, it's too late for the blooper reel. I I know I know, but um. Yeah, no, I think they definitely dodged bullets right there with the injuries. Because I mean, how many more quarterback losses could you take before the whole Jenga tower falls apart? Well, that's what Nick. I'll throw it to you. You know, the, the Jimmy Garoppolo injury. I mean, I it's not crazy to think that they might be able to survive because with Garoppolo, their offense was still kind of hit or miss, and we've seen it now with Purdy. I know it's only been two weeks here, but thirty three against Miami, and now thirty five against Tampa. I mean, now if you start going to the third stringers, it could be another story here. But, I mean, it looks like they might be able – can they get by with Purdy? Yeah, I I just – the Niners are a good team. I, they're proving that the quarterback doesn't matter. Their pieces around the quarterback are, are great. CMC, Debo, when he's healthy, you're probably not going to have him this week. Um. And they just have a, a a slew of other guys that really just step up and make that team go. Now, I looked at the performance. Brock Purdy outplayed, and I mean seriously outplayed Tom Brady in every way, shape, or form. And I was talking to uh, to Tom and Nick from uh, my show, and they were saying that Tom Brady might be obsolete the way he's playing now. And it's like an embarrassment putting him out there right now. And I agree. It's an, it's an embarrassment to put him out there right now. That's not really a stretch. No, oh, it's, it's it's not. I mean, the story's about him already planning his future coming out this week, too, down there. And, you know, now they go home and they take on the uh, Bengals. And here's all you need to know. You know, they take on the Bengals on Sunday, and they're not even favored at home against the Bengals. I mean, what does that, that, what does that go to show you? I mean, Tampa right now, the only thing they've got going for them is that wonderful NFC South. That's that's their saving grace right here. When you look, I think the Panthers might have a shot to win the division, though. Well, so it's funny because now let's, you look at this rest of this division here real quick. Uh, you know, you've got the Falcons who are going to go to Desmond Ritter coming out of the bye, and you've got the, uh, the Saints who are going to stick with Dalton, according to Dennis Allen. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't th- I don't think James Winston's ever going to see the field again unless you know there's an injury to Dalton. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, tough scene there in Tampa. Sunday night football. It was the uh, Chargers over the Dolphins. I, I totally botched that one. I thought the better talent was with the uh, Dolphins, but right now the Dolphins now. That's two straight weeks like that, and now they go to snowy to what looks like could be snowy Buffalo on Saturday night. Uh, not not a good sign here for Miami. And I think they might lose that one too. To be honest, I, I would agree with you there. That's that's, that's problematic. Yeah, going going to snowy Buffalo. I mean, that's they're not. Not to mention it. they already beat Buffalo earlier in the year. How hard is it to beat your division? beat a really good powerhouse like Buffalo twice. Also, you can't just turn the air conditioner up in Miami and say that's playing in a cold situation. Oh, <laughs> that yeah, was, no. yeah, that story was crazy. What were they using? Space heaters in uh, in L.A.? Is that what it was? Yeah, uh, apparently. And you, you can't s- simulate a snowy, rainy, 20-degree day unless you're just going to have someone up in the Raptors dumping water on you and and... And icicles and stuff all over your head, then you can't do that. 
After, no, that's for sure. And then the Monday night game, we kind of briefly discussed it at the start of this segment with the Patriots getting past the uh, Cardinals 27 to 13. But guys, really the big story, third play of the game for the, for the Cardinals, Kyler Murray gets carted off the field with the non-contact injury. And of course, those are the worst kind, the non-contact knee injuries. And, you know, that's why this brought up this discussion about the whole quarterback, the future for the Cardinals, because if it is a torn ACL, you know, he's going to start missing part of 2023. You've got so much money invested in. That's why the likes of like Baker Mayfield and Jacoby Brissett, I think have to be in the discussion for the Cardinals next season. If it is indeed, in fact, a torn ACL for Kyler, because you're not going to go out there and draft the QB despite the fact that you, because you gave all the money to Murray. So you have to go for like a journeyman kind, I would think. Right. I mean, your teeth are sunk in at this point. You spent $230 million on your quarterback for the future, supposedly. Um, and now I think the Ravens are watching the Cardinals and say, oops, my quarterback's injured. Do I really want to spend that money? But I don't know. The Cardinals are a, a bad situation. I said it in the ETV minute that I did that they're a dumpster fire. Okay. They are a dumpster fire. They're four and nine. They're going nowhere. Colt McCoy is a journeyman quarterback at best, as you two would know. Mm-hmm. Um, he's right. But he's good, but he, he can't take you. He's not taking you into the future. No. And I, you're taking Baker of those two. You're not. First of all, Jacoby Brissett has earned the right to say that he's not going to go play for a team that's a dumpster fire. The way he's played with the Browns, so I think it's going to be Baker if they're going to choose someone to fill a few weeks. Well, like we said, you know, Hank, I said it to you when we one of our first shows together that Baker is going to. I think it's going to be the same in 2023. Baker is going to land on a team that's des- in desperate need of a QB. And let's say Kyler's torn ACL. I mean, it's the middle of December. It's not like he's he's not going to be able to come back by week one in 2023. A bit of a downgrade if we're talking about Oklahoma quarterbacks. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. And that's going to be one thing to watch here, all these injuries uh, in the coming weeks. There's still four weeks. And, you know, as we come down the stretch here, guys, this might just be a survival of the fittest, really, when you look at all these teams in the league right now. Uh you know, everybody's dealing with injuries, but it's amazing the quarterbacks that are just going down here. It's, I mean, like I said at the start, I think it's 60 QBs that have seen a snap at some point this year, and we've still got four weeks to go. And we're going to see some more because a few of them are in concussion protocol, and obviously we know with, with Kyler Murray, this knee injury. So we're going to definitely see some uh, different matchups when we do our picks uh, later on in the week here, especially that – Stellar game out there in Denver between the Cardinals and the Broncos. So we'll uh, <laughs> we'll find out there. But speaking of Week 15, guess what, guys? It gets going Thursday night uh, up there at the 12th man in Seattle. It is an Al Kirk and Kaylee special on Amazon Prime. The San Francisco 49ers taking on those Seattle Seahawks. And the 49ers, Hank, are a three-and-a-half-point road, road favorite. Oh, boy. 49ers being a three-and-a-half-point favorite. The hook scares me, but you know what? This might be a little bit of bias because as Giants fans, we need the 49ers to win, and I'm emphasizing need the way George Lopez did in one of my favorite episodes of that show. (laughs) Um, Give me the Niners. Nick, what do you think? Um, I mean, bias or no bias aside, I still think the Niners are the better team. I know it's weird. I know they have a quarterback issue going on in their organization right now, but Seattle, like I said earlier, is running out of gas you know and they look we like we haven't really given enough credit to for the 49ers, Kyle Shanahan. He's one of the yes. best. He's done, he's done a lot with offense. I mean, he basically has turned. When it, whenever when it comes to offenses, he's essentially turned chick, chicken shit into chicken salad. <laughs> it's it's true. You're absolutely right, and that's. I just think the Niners are better. I think Gino's in struggle mode right now. I would take the Niners to win. If it's yeah, see, get them, and we also had that call. <laughs> and I, Nick made an excellent point when we did the Week 14 recap. I think the Seahawks are running on fumes, and this is now a very quick turnaround again. For them, and we don't know. I don't know what the status of Kenneth uh, Walker is, their 
great running back who's been great this year. Uh, he was hurt, did not play, was missed big time. And if you don't have, you know, they were down two running backs against the Panthers. And that means if you don't have them, that's going to force Geno Smith to throw against this defense. I don't care if this game's up in Seattle. We've seen that not be that much of a factor as in years past. Even if it's not Brett Purdy, which I don't even know who the third string guy is. I think it's Jacob Eason or something like that. I have to go look. Yeah, but it is. I think I, it is. Yeah. I think they've. I think they've got still a good enough team around. I almost be more. I have to look at the over under. I don't know what the over under is on this. I'd be more comfortable almost taking that. But as far as this goes, I am going to take San Francisco to win and cover here because I just think that they've got enough. They've got just enough to get this one done. Yeah, Hank, I agree with you. That hook does scare me, and that's Vegas being very sneaky again. But I still think San Francisco's got just enough to get this one done up there on Thursday night. So that's what we're going to roll with here mm -hmm. as well. Well, the MLB hot stove has been hot, to say the least. It's been on fire. Last week we were on, we were wondering where – the big story was where was Aaron Judge going to land? And lo and behold, again, just about it, it was a few hours. It was last Wednesday morning, so just after our show aired and right before Nick and Tom went on for Empty the Bench, we, we got the news Aaron Judge was like 8.30 in the morning Eastern on Wednesday – he came back to the Yankees. Nine years, $360 million. Guys, the first thing I thought of, and I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts, was the Yanks went to that ninth year. The first two offers that they supposedly had offered Judge, we know before the start of last season, was the eight for 230. And then there was a purported eight years for $300 million. And I did an ETB minute on this when that report broke, the eight for 300. That was not going to get it done. And the Giants, last Tuesday night, we I think went to bed thinking the Giants were going to get him because they had a nine-year, three hundred sixty million dollar offer supposedly on the table. But the fact that the Yanks went to that ninth year, I think, helped tremendously. And I think also Aaron Judge admitting, and I mean, we we heard the reports too, taking less money to remain a Yankee because there was a supposed ten-year, four hundred million dollar offer on the table from the Padres, but he ultimately wanted to be a Yankee. So I think him wanted to remain a Yankee, and the fact that the organization also went to that ninth year. I think helped too. Hank? Yeah, I definitely would agree. And look, at the end of the day, I think I would have to say that I am extremely relieved that it's all over because, I mean, look, let's put it this way. I don't know about you guys, but I was starting to get tired of the whole will he, won't he suspense regarding Aaron Judge and will he stay. But you know what? He's staying and, you know, at the end of the day, very lucky that we're going to have a guy who pretty – we get to keep the face of the franchise around for a very long time. I'm already seeing photoshops of his uh, Monument Park plaque and the circular number 99 that will eventually be, be put in Monument Park. However, let's not kid ourselves. And again, I'm going to quote Jaguar Gator 9. This contract is going to be ugly with a capital U by the end because i mean let's face it do you expect him to keep up the same production from mid to late 30s as now much less do you even expect a 62 home run season the answer no. is a resounding excuse me no dang it what is up with me in these like burps and <laughs> by the way i would say one thing we need to put out an sos first of all <laughs> We need to put out an SOS for John Heyman because he forgot how to do his job in the process of reporting the arson judge signing. Oh, man. So, what, a, what a disaster. We, we need to put that SOS out because he was completely wrong in this situation with Aaron Judge, thinking that he was going to end up in a Giants uniform. Now, we don't know exactly what their offer was. We heard it reportedly was higher than the last ditch offer before the Yankees made the offer and spoke to Judge. But the Padres offer is the one that's more stunning to me. The 10 years, $400 million. It seems like the Padres, who are a, what, a mid-level market organization, to, to really be fair, and they're out spending all this money, and we'll get to another name in a little bit that they actually did sign, but... Where is all this money coming from, from San Diego? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. You know what it is? It is Preller Palooza. 
<laughs> well, you know, think about it. That's, you know what AJ Fowler that... reminds me of? James what? Holtzauer. Why do I say James Holtzauer? Because this is what he's doing. All in. Oh, all in. Right, yep. It, it's a giant gamble. Yeah. It's and massive gamble. Yeah, it's the, it's the second. Well, you know what? It's like they did two daily doubles with two players, and they both missed. You know, they did it with Judge, and they did it. Didn't they also do it with Trey Turner, too? Um, Alex, I'm going to wager uh, 20,000. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and miss and miss daily, and miss the daily double. That's really what it is. But isn't it, didn't they also like oh, offer more money for Trey Turner? And then he went to Philadelphia. So it was the second they time. Supposedly, they supposedly offered him like 370, Trey Turner. It's just, it's just it's just wild. I mean, all this money. I mean, and, just, and they struck out. Usually yeah. in baseball, baseball, it's usually all about the money. So, like, he turned down, what, $70 million to go to Philly? Yeah. I'm sorry, Nick. What did you just say? It's, it's all about the money. money. <laughs> all the oh. references are coming out on the last live show of the year. Absolutely. Only fitting. Only yeah. fitting. And, and, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but. You know that's the, that's the thing. So I I don't know how you guys felt, but I mean I went to bed Tuesday night thinking that he was going to San Francisco. Like it was going to be announced at like two or three o'clock in the morning. I might have woken up Wednesday morning just as the news was breaking because you know the the, the winter meetings were happening out there in San Diego, so it could have happened. Mm -hmm. You know it would have been midnight over there. But when I heard he went back to the Yanks Wednesday morning about eight thirty a.m. and they went to that ninth year, that to me was the was the was one of the big things. Because the Yanks didn't go to the ninth year in the beginning, and we've seen it now with, with a lot of these players in baseball, especially. It's the years. As much as it's about the money, it's, it's also about the years. And I just always think of Freddie Freeman as that perfect example because the Dodgers went to that sixth year. The Braves would not would not go six years with him. Right. And that was a little and, bit of the agent agent stuff, but you get my point on that. Right. And Hank, I would ask you now. They made the move. But what's next? This can't be the only thing. They got to get run down. They got to go make a move here. Correct. I definitely would agree that they need to keep going because obviously, well, obviously they need pitching. I mean, it's nice to have Garrett Cole and Nestor Cortez, but get run to, wrote on in that pitching rotation. I think you're definitely in better shape. And we're not even factoring another era that ha area that has plenty of holes. The leaky pen. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm so used to saying, oh, the pen's one of one of our strengths. Although in recent years, that hasn't always been the case. And you guys know I've been on record calling our world as Chapman, the real life uh, Ricky Vaughn. <laughs> That's great. So, do you think, though, that the Yankees will spend the money and the years to get that it will take to get run uh, Carlos Rodon in here? I mean, look. That's what. That's why I'm actually hesitant about it. I know that there's been reports saying that they are actually the favorites and that they're going to make a, an offer to him, but I'm I'm kind of nervous that they're not going to go the length that it's going to take to get him. Now, are you? I'm wait a minute. About are, that too, because I mean, look, it's been proven time and time again. If you're if you're not going to spend the money, you're not going to get the guy you want. I mean, but no. the Yankees are a big market team; they should be able to do this. Are you going to spend two hundred million on Rodon? That's a lot of money. Well, I, uh, reports are that it's going to take six, seven years, possibly, and, and it might be that much. I mean, I don't know, six for one eighty, seven for two hundred, something along those lines. I don't know if the Yanks. I mean, we've seen them be dishing out these long contracts before, and it seems like they're trying to do away from it. Uh, the, the judge thing, I think, is a little different because it's a homegrown guy, so it's a little bit different in that regard. But uh, now that being said, though, Nick, the Yanks do need to make a counter move here because if you look at what the Blue Jays did bringing in Chris Bassett, you look at that rotation now with Bassett, it's Manoa, Kevin Gaussman, Chris Bassett, Jose Barrios, and uh, Yusei Kikuchi. I mean, that's a pretty good one through five there in Toronto. So to me, if you're the Yankees, I, you've got to counter that right now because, I mean, you've got Cole, you've got Cortez, you've got Severino. Uh, who else? I mean, Tyone's gone. He went to Chicago. So, I mean, where else are you, go where else are you going at right now? I mean, Domingo Herman, I, I mean... I mean, you have to get Rodon. And usually, I'm you know this about me. I'm against all the large contracts. I was against the Aaron Judge contract. I've been I, I've been getting yelled at by Nick for how long now? Saying that I thought I the, judge, the Judge contract was an overreach. 
I mean, I could hear. I heard about it in my head when I asked about the uh, the money with Rodon, but yeah, go ahead. Come on, Nick! It's all about giving a blank check. It's blank check. It's a blank check. <laughs> well, and uh, it's fitting. I don't know why, but I'm just holding this baseball bat for the hell of it. Well, I'll yeah. tell you why because the off season in baseball is more fun than the regular season. Some in some ways, it is. You're right. And by the way, because the will he won't he. Yeah. Right. And by the way, as we speak, the Giants just made a another move. So, another move. So the Giants missed out on uh, on Judge, and they missed out on uh, – there was another starter they were going after, too, and they missed out on. But they did get uh, Mitch Hanniger from the from the Mariners. They've got um, – I'm just trying to think of all the guys in my head. I know they just got Ross Stripling, the former Blue Jay. And That's it, yeah. Uh, yeah. From Dodger. Right. And who – there was they signed another pitcher, too, that I'm just – uh, whose name I'm forgetting about right now off the top of my head, but so they're they're getting kind of the backups, the backup guys here as well. But um, but you've got that. But yes, uh, I mean, I think the Yanks need to counter the the Bassett signing here because that that rotation is pretty deep there in Toronto. And mm-hmm. as far as the Yanks, any other moves, I don't know what else they're going to be able to do. I would see. I said this to Hank Nick, and I'm I'm curious what you thought. I I know that he got a crazy contract. I thought Brandon Nimmo was the perfect fit for the Yankees because you know what? He's a defensive guy. He plays. He gets on base. He's a left-handed contact hitter. They, the Yanks don't have enough of those kind of players on the team. But I, just I don't, agree. The amount of money that he got from the Mets, I don't think they were going to go that deep. I thought he would have gotten a hundred million dollar contract. And if I'm the Yanks, I mean, I thought Nimmo. I mean, let's be honest, guys. You can agree with me. With this Nimmo more than over uh, Aaron Hicks. Yes. Oh, that that's not even a question. I right. mean, but I could see Bader and Nimmo in the outfield. Uh and yeah, in the outfield would have been an insane tandem. They would have caught every ball out there and left right. in center field. I mean yeah. Can't forget about that. So it would have been a good move. Now I kind of see Nimmo as like what we have with LeMahieu when he's healthy, mm-hmm. where he can kind of he gets on base, he'll hit for power when necessary, he'll take the ball the other way. I mean, heck, I was at the game at City Field where Brendan Nimmo made that insane catch off the wall in right center. Absolutely, yep. That was probably the play of the year, to be honest. But I agree. it would have been a great signing, but you can only sign so much. Now, if they had signed, I think they would have gone after Nimmo if the judge had come off the market a lot quicker. Right. But we all knew that Nimmo was probably going back to the Mets. I just but think they're, but they're going to sacrifice in other places, even though Steve Cohen could print enough money to save all the world hunger at this point. But I'm going to get to the Mets in just a second. But <laughs> I, I would see. I just thought that Nimmo Lemayhew would have been excellent one too. And I know yeah, Judge no, really, I agree. Yeah, and I know Judge is really more suited for a sec, a second, a two spot. But I just think also you have those two kind of contact, get on base kind of guys there at the top. And again, there's no coincidence, and everybody was complaining about this when they re-signed Brian Cashman. But Cashman was trying to get, was trying to change this team a little bit too, in that he brought in Lemayhew, he brought in Ben Attendee, and those two guys were not were not healthy in the postseason. Now I'm not telling you they would have beaten the the Astros, but those two guys would have at least given them a better chance to at least make a deeper run. And those two guys not being there shortened the lineup up, made Judge continue to have Judge in the leadoff spot. Um. I just don't think that's that's perfect. So I don't know where the Yankees go here next. I mean, I know they got Tommy Canely last week too in the bullpen, but uh, yeah, they, they definitely need some more pieces here. I mean, Rodon would be nice, but we'll see. They're cheaping out again, which is concerning to me. Now, are they going to spend the money? I mean, and Nick would say, "Oh, look, they spent the money." First of all, I wouldn't classify this as a free agency signing. I classify it as you re-signed your guy who was up for a new contract. So that was kind of mandatory. You had to sign him. Otherwise, you were blowing up this whole team and you were not competing this coming year. So yeah. you want to you need to go out and sign a free agent. You need to go out and sign Rodon if that's your plan to make the pitching better. Then you have to go do it. If you're not going to do it, I get it because of the money. But it is what it is. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree with that. Well, we'll find out. I mean, in some ways, the offseason still just getting started, even though there's been a bunch of craziness that's been happening. And 
I have to give kudos to Jeff Passan because he said he wrote about this on ESPN two weeks ago. He thought with the winter meetings being the first time it was face to face since 2019 that there was going to be a tremendous amount of action. And you know what? There definitely has been with Aaron Judge. You know, Wilson Contreras went to the Cardinals for five years. Uh, so he he's going to be the replacement for uh, Yadier Molina. And that'll be something, too, you know, when Wilson when Contreras goes back to Chicago in those in those matchups next year, too. By the way, I think they overpaid. Uh, that That's the word of the offseason. Everyone is overpaying. And that's what you know. What it's going to take? It's going to take that to get these guys. That's really what it is. You, I, I mean, Wilson Contreras is an offensive catcher. Can we agree on that front? Yes. And if you remember when we did our baseball uh, trade deadline show, all of us, Wilson Contreras was supposedly in the Mets were supposedly in play, but his defense was very suspect. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Mets decided at the end of the day to not go after him, which I thought was smart. But he definitely will provide you the offense. And now, obviously, with no longer with no uh, with no pitcher hitting anymore in either league, the DH in both leagues. Uh, he even if he doesn't do well defensively, you can have him as a as a DH. But yeah, five years, a lot of money uh, as well there to the Cardinals. And then Hank, the Padres did end up getting a player. It was Xander Bogarts from the Red Sox, eleven years, two hundred and eighty million dollars. I'm gonna. Do you want me to do it again? Go for it. I'm gonna do it again. Going on. <laughs> I mean, you have. It's like, oh, we got Tatis. Ah, screw it. Let's just splurge, splurge the heck out of Xander Bogart since we can't get Trey Turner. Yes. I mean, look, Xander is one of the one of, if not arguably, the best shortstops in baseball. But eleven years. Uh, and he's probably, you know, we spoke about this last week, Hank. These shortstops, they get this huge kind of contract. What usually ends up happening? They have to switch positions. Yeah. Actually, I'll say it right now. Uh, A-Rod kind of ended up, well, I would say it's 100% his fault, but he eventually was probably going to end up at third base with that large contract. That's what they do. They go from shortstop to third. And I think Bogarts, they were already talking about him being at third base because they have uh, Tatis. Look at Tatis. He's playing the outfield. Yeah, that's crazy there, too. But let me talk about the Red Sox here for just a second. I know they got Kenley Jansen uh, last week, too. But I look at the Red Sox here. They, you know, not being – and I brought this up with you guys at the time that this happened, not being able to keep their own guys. You know, they traded Mookie Betts away. They traded Ben Attendee away. They let Bogarts go. And then they didn't re-sign Carl, Kyle Schwarber, and he ended up hitting 46 home runs last year to lead the National League. And then the move they did make last year – Trying to signing Trevor Story to a six year, hundred forty million dollar contract, and what did he do in his first season in Boston? Two thirty eight, nothing. Six, Sixteen homers, sixty six RBIs in ninety four games. I'll tell you right now, Red Sox fans are going to lose their minds if Trevor Story is the starting shortstop for the Red Sox this coming season. I mean, I don't think. Well, what other options do you have? I mean, they've got. I mean, Jeter Downs. I'm just trying to think of their prospects. Connor Wong. Uh, I know Hank, you're more of the, the prospect kind of guy, but. Um, those are the guys they really have. Mm -hmm. And the Red I mean, Sox in a division where all five of those teams are good. You know, the Orioles are no longer a, uh, a walkover. I mean, Tampa's Tampa. The Blue Jays are finally playing better again, even though they lost in the worst possible way in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, but the Red Sox, I don't know what the Red Sox are thinking right now. Now, this was an overpay, and, and and I know I keep using that word, and people are going to say, "Well, why do you keep saying that?" Because it, it was Xander Bogarts is not worth is not worth eleven years, two hundred eighty million. Sorry, the Padres are drunk in sailors spending money right now. And how old? But is they are Bogarts. Well, actually, you know, you know what else I would compare them to? Oh. A college freshman who just uses his credit card like crazy because he has no experience and has no restraint. <laughs> yeah. By, by the way, he's 30 years old. You just gave a 30-year-old 11-year contract. Well, he won't be – He like we said, you know what? He won't be a shortstop. He'll be over third or he'll be moved to another position. I mean, I mean, I guess uh, having the DH of both leagues, now they, they don't care if they're given contracts. Way back when, when you didn't have a DH in the National League, you didn't see very many 10-year or 11-year contracts in the National League. 
Now you will. Now with the H's there. Yeah. Well, and if these and if this doesn't pan out, who do you think we could blame for this? Hmm. Mm. Try not to bite my lip. Da, da, oh, it'd be good if I was pink too. Da, what, this guy? That's da, it. That's da, him. Da, da, da. I mean, he'd be, <laughs> start with him. It would start da, with he who should not be da, named. Let's da, just say it would start with Gorm, as Hank would, as Hank uh, had put. Had <laughs> we should. Acronym, yeah. Yeah, but that's uh, well, that's what's going on there. And then let's get to the Mets here, who have been probably, in my opinion, one of the biggest winners of the off season so far because. Yes, they lose Jacob DeGrom, which is turning out to be more and more the right decision. I mean, first of all, DeGrom to go, and I don't want to go off, and I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Maybe this could be a Johnny Rantz too. I mean, to tell me you go to Texas and you go in there and basically say you have a great chance of winning, I mean, come on. We know why he went. He went because they went the extra mile or two with the money. I mean, you cannot tell me that the Texas Rangers have a better chance than the Mets to go to the World Series. Now, I get what Texas is doing. I like what they're doing. They're almost kind of following the Mets model a little bit and bringing in a, an experienced manager, you know, bringing in some guys. You know, they got a very good farm system there. But, you, but you've but you got the Astros in that division. You've got the Mariners. I mean, yeah, you've got the Angels and the, and the A's. But, I mean, Jake, you cannot tell me you went there because they gave you the best chance to win. They gave you the most money. Just – just if that's what you're trying to say, just say it. We know. Well – it is. It's it's silly, and we'll see you. We'll see you in late August over there at City Field, unless they want to pull a no no Syndergaard there in Texas. Oh God! The one thing I will say though, because I definitely want to hear what Hank has to say about this, but I remember Texas has the less taxes. That's the other reason why he went to Texas. Right. That is true. So I think he pretty much got tired of getting no run support and pitching for so many mediocre to average Mets teams. And look, oh, geez, what is wrong with me today? Um, <laughs> five years, thir- uh, what was it, $137 million. I still think the Mets made the right decision. And you want to know what's weird? You could argue that the Mets might be a better team now, and you could even argue that the, Mites, that the Mets actually – Actually, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think they have a homegrown pitcher on their staff now. David, no, David Peterson. That's it. Oh yeah, right. But uh, that that number you were asking about five years, 185 with an escalator to 222. Still think that was the right call because what if he gets hurt during that time? I mean, you've seen his reputation. Now, Emma, Look. Jesus Christ, I gotta stop yawning. <laughs> um, am I like a hundred percent sold on their rotation? I mean, no, because what if one or both of your two uh, hired guns get hurt? And by hired guns, obviously, I'm talking about Mad Max and Geriatric Justin. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just cannot. Um, I think that on paper, the Mets look like they could be a better team this year but there's a reason we don't play the games on paper well i'll say this guys i mean let me go through some of these signings here because well first of all i had a met fan go out on twitter and tell me that this jose quintana signing was a disaster which i could not disagree more i think this i think the jose quintana was actually one of the more underrated signings of the off season i'll tell you why he made 32 starts last year pitched to an under under three you need you need an innings eater kind of guy and you know what i got that for two years and $32 million, and I let Taiwan Walker walk, who got four and 72 from Philadelphia. To me, yeah, that was that deal was insane, by the way. To me, Verlander and Quintana are better, are better fits. I'm not saying they're better overall pitchers, but better fits than DeGrom and Walker and Bassett, if you want to go, if you want to go to that, to that extreme. And so pretty much what you did was you traded DeGrom, Walker, and Bassett. For Verlander, Quintana, and Sanga. The one knock on Quintana is is just the elbow, the arm. Just making sure it's healthy. Now I know he, he made his starts, he made 32 starts last year, but over the years, the knock is the durability on his arm. Now I, I think he can be a good starter for the Mets. I think that the stamina and hopefully 
if he gives them 30 or 32 starts, the bullpen won't get burned out like it did last year. They were in massive burnout mode. One, because DeGrom just was not making his starts. He was hurt because he would usually be out there pitching six to seven innings a start when he's out there. But I, I don't think Quintana's a bad signing. I really don't. No, I mean, 32 starts last year. Uh, his uh, – just trying to pull it up here right now. 32 starts. He was um, – I don't look at the win-loss record. I look at the ERA. 2.93 ERA in 165 innings, 137 strikeouts, 11 less hits than innings pitched. Gave up just eight home runs in 32 starts last year. And 137 that's, – That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you know what? We, I mean, how many starts do we see uh, Tywin Walker giving up all those home runs? Uh, you know, Sanga, all the reports about what he's been overseas, I mean, looks like is a great signing. But you know what the Mets have also done here now with these with this Quintana and Sanga signings too is given them rotational depth. I mean, these are the guys you have in that rota- that have options to be in the rotation next year. Verlander, Ser- Scherzer, Sanga, Quintana, Carrasco, Tyler McGill, David Peterson, Eliezer Hernandez, who they got from the Marlins, and then remember Joey Lucchese, who had Tommy John surgery and did not pitch last year, the former Padre. So the Mets, that's – what am I just going to be? Three, four, five, six. That, that's nine guys right now. And if there's anything we've learned in baseball, the more the better. So I, I like what they've done. I like the David Robertson signing. I'm just hoping it's not one year too late with, with Robertson. But I like him in the back end of that bullpen maybe to set up for Diaz. And Brandon Nimmo, I, like I said, I think Brandon Nimmo is a, is a great – so, I mean, that's a lot of money, but you know, it's a homegrown guy and stuff. So, you know, what? I, I think the Mets have had a very, very good offseason here. I have to say, I think the rotation, I think it's gotten better. And that's something they needed to do. And they need the depth because I think I'd sign up right now for 25 starts each from Verlander and Scherzer in 2023. So the fact that you have other, those, all those guys behind him, like I just brought up, I think is smart. We'll see what happens. Yeah, because you know what, the Braves are still making moves. I mean, they just got Sean Murphy from the uh, from the A's in a three way trade. You know, the Phillies have been making been very active. The Nationals and the Marlins have been quiet, but I think that's what you expected it to be. But you know what, the Mets are going out there and trying to make all the moves. Well, big basketball story that I want to. There's two basketball things here, but I want to get to this thing that happened last week that really wasn't talked about a lot, but I think is a problem that basketball has been running into here with. You know, the potential of the CBA uh, coming up here at the end of the season. So we all know that load management is a big problem in the NBA. And it is increasing and is only getting worse. I know Nick is a huge, is like me, is a huge NBA fan. But we saw that, I saw the story on Saturday. The Nets are in the second half of a back-to-back going to Indiana to take on the Pacers. And all the players that they had out, two because of injury and six because of load management and to me this just speaks to a big problem that the nba has in terms of load management and the fact that you get all these players out and the problem is is the nets won 136 to 133 so the fact that these guys were all out and they still put up 136 points and one doesn't mean anything no, and it's, and it's and it's continuing this slippery slide that we're going to get to at the end of the year. I felt like this with baseball when we were heading towards that lockout. I'm feeling like we're going down this road again in the NBA with load management, with these players just saying, "Ah, hey, you know what? I'm going to take the day off." Never saw this back in the Jordan days. No, first of all, if you took a day off in the Jordan days, you were crucified. If you took a day off, but. And by the way, I think the two sides agreed to an extension to put the deadline out further as they're continuing to have discussions about the CBA. I think that was ratified uh, earlier this uh, week. But I don't know what to make of the situation. The Nets, uh, by the way, I'm not surprised that the Nets were the one who did it. Now, I told the guys a story before we started that the Spurs and a certain guy that we can't stand anymore, I can't stand anymore, is the one who started this, Kawhi Leonard, who just said, you know what? I'm just going to not play today. By the way, that man's made way more money than any other athlete deserves to make because he sits out way more games than he should. 
And then they had that whole situation in San Antonio where Greg Popovich decided, you know what? I'm going to sit Kawhi. I'm going to sit Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan. And what they failed to realize is that it was a TNT national game. And they end up getting fined $250,000 because the NBA does not fool around with their nationally televised games. So I don't know. I think this was a local game. So I guess it didn't matter on that front. But you can't sit eight players. What about the fans, the kids that spend the hard-earned money to go to these games and you're not playing? It's not right. KD and Kyrie were not playing. People are there to see them as much as that pains me to say people are there to see Kyrie Irving. Blech. But anyway, you're there, you paid to see a product. And when you don't get the product, you want your money back. Not for sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that the load management is definitely a bigger problem than people realize. And I feel bad for the fans who basically paid to see the Nets without like a lot of these guys. It's just, uh, it's just such a watered down product. It's why I probably would have watched NBA more in like the eighties and the nineties. Where was Jordan's? Um, imagine if you told Jordan to take a load management day, he'd probably have to like punch you in the face. I was going to say, he's going to look at you. He's going to give you the look saying, wait, and yeah. um, can I, let me quote Jordan in the documentary. And I took that shit personally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also, you know what you wouldn't have seen in the Jordan days? A game a game that without all those players that the Nets would have that the Nets won one thirty six to one thirty three in regulation. I mean those that, are that's 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 right? incredible to me that they won the damn game, considering that K D, Kyrie, and a bunch of other guys were out. I mean, look look listen to some of these names uh from from Saturday, Nick. Cam Thomas led the Nets with thirty three in 29 minutes and then you had uh well, we all know patty mills uh edmund sumner had 21 points uh deron sharp 20 markeith morris i know him from uh the clippers he scored 15 but you had kessler edwards uh yuda wannabe who i i think you were telling me before the show is an up-and-coming guy there in brooklyn David apparently everyone is on his heels apparently Right. Uh, David Duke Jr., seven points. And then Alondis Williams got five minutes of time, too, as well. But, you know, the likes of, like, Seth Curry, Joe Harris, and, uh, like you said, Durant, Kyrie, just some of the eight players that did not play for the Nets. And yet they still put up 136 points and won the game, which is just absolutely incredible. And you look at the NBA this year where it seems like nobody wants to play defense whatsoever. It is just absolutely incredible. Uh, what is going on? You, the do you know what the uh, who lead what team leads the league in scoring this year? I would say maybe the Bucks, but I don't know. It's the Boston Celtics at one nineteen point three, which is just wild. In fact, the team that's thirtieth, that's yeah, the, the two teams that are tied at the bottom in terms of points per game are putting up just under a hundred and eight. I have never seen anything like this before. I remember the days back I've, in the late, late 90s. In fact, actually, let's put it in perspective. Let's go back to... Well, wait. I was going to say, are the Lakers at the bottom of that? They are not. No, the Lakers are are the 11th highest scoring team in the league this year. Just under 115 per Damn. game. But That's crazy. Just to put that in perspective, let's go back to... Uh, Let's go back to Jordan's last Bulls t- uh, winner, 1990, the 97-98 season, mm-hmm. right? The team that led okay. the, league, the, the team that led the league in points per game scored 105 and a half in 90. And just think about that. What? So the the team that led the league the team the league in scoring scored a, averaged 105 and a half per game, and now in 2022-2023. The third, the worst, the lowest scoring team in the league is averaging more than that. Wow. I think there's a few reasons why, and we've documented this before. I think there's no, no defense. I think the, sco- the the shooters are much better than they were back then. And also, these guys don't use the whole 24 second shot clock. 
we saw the like, well you know, that that's the that that's the Mike D'Antoni method. Yeah, and he's and that spread like nothing. But yeah, so it's just incredible. I mean, hundred. I mean, when you when you have guys like James Harden who all they care about is offense and no defense, then that's what happens. I mean, I just that's, that's nuts. I right. mean, there's a few guys: James Harden, Carmelo Anthony, guys who didn't care about defense. I mean, uh, it's Carmelo. rare that you have guys like Gian- like Giannis who actually play both sides of the ball. Yeah, Giannis is one in, one in a few. I'll tell you that much. But yeah, the other thing with the NBA that was announced on Tuesday was that the NBA did name does have new names and trophies for major individual awards. So the MVP this year is now being called the Michael Jordan Trophy. The Defensive Player of the Year, the Hakeem Olajuwon Trophy. Rookie of the Year, the Will Chamberlain. Sixth Man of the Year, John Havlicek. Most Improved, George Mikan. And the new Clutch Player of the Year is going to be the Jerry West Trophy. Uh, Nick, I know we spoke about this before, but you have a problem with this. I do have a problem with this. Usually when you name awards or you name buildings or you name studios, well... There's one studio I could think of that they got completely wrong, and it has to do with a radio station that had a prominent show that Hank and I were listening to stuff from before. But <laughs> um, I just – how can you name awards after people who are still alive? That's what I don't understand. That's weird to me. That's not weird to you guys? It's different. I mean, I guess I'm going to take it a little differently because I'm thinking of stages, and I'm thinking uh, – I'm not thinking of sports, but I'm thinking of, like, stages or studios – they did it with people that were still alive. Um, of course, you know, the first thing I think about, you know, think about game shows. I'm going to say the Bob Barker studio at CBS in Hollywood. They did that while he was still the host of The Price is Right. But well, I guess. Yeah, that made no he'd sense. Already been, he'd already been hosting for like a good amount of time. And I guess they wanted to find a way to honor him while he was like still alive and could appreciate the. Honor. I guess I guess the, the one that would make the most sense was the Alex Trebek stage for Jeopardy. I think they did that right after he passed. Yeah, right. Right. But that. I think. I, I think that was coming, though, considering his cancer fight was coming to an end. So I think right. they knew that was coming. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, uh, let's watch this, though. Him. And I like that they showed the family, like, doing the ribbon-cutting ceremony for the studio and blocking out a lot of um, Mike Richards. And I don't mean one of my least favorite Philadelphia Flyers. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I'm, but I'm saying is like the Michael Jordan MVP award. Like that's weird because like he's the goat. He's alive and he's not old. <laughs> like it's it's weird. Even when he does get old, you're not going to think he's old. It's different. right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Like that's Even that's why it's bizarre to me. Like in his seventies or eighties, you're not gonna you're not gonna think of him as being an old man. And uh, even when he's dead, you're not gonna think you're not gonna think you feel like he's dead. You're just gonna see his legend living forever. I mean, I'll I'll make the bizarre reference I was talking about with Hank. Like at WFAN, they have a studio called the Mike Francesa Studios. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, well, that, the man an ego satisfi- satisfactory ego thing. And not the and you know my history. I I don't really like Mike to be honest. But my point is, how are you naming a studio after someone who's still alive? And correct me if I'm wrong. That's that, my point. They did that while he was still working at the fan, right? Yes, they did. So maybe that's just, even we- weirder. So maybe it's a trend, though. It could just be a trend in in the world. Forget just just sports. Maybe this just goes above uh, beyond that. Maybe it's. I think I, you know it's different. That's for sure. I don't know what to make of it though. I thought it's different. That's that's the way I would I would say. It. And what it. about the participation trophy? That's the other one I don't get. Well, we're, are we going to give this? Give it to somebody who plays. Oh, are you talking about the President's Day trophy? You know that, and also whatever that oh. other one you said, John. No, that's I'm basically making another hockey comparison. No, no, no. It it is. I even said it to you guys before the show that this award, the for best record, is the President's Trophy. They're copying. Who would have thought the NBA was going to copy the NHL? No offense to the NHL, but. Yeah, I was. Who thought the NBA was going to copy that? <laughs> I mean, as I said, no offense, but I've never. I, the NBA doesn't copy anybody. And she usually, have to. No, it's exactly right. Who. But yeah, and then as far as you know, 
as we start to wind down the year here, well, I mean, in terms of the, the winter sports, I know Hank's happy. His Rangers have won our, – our Rangers have won four in a row. The, uh, the Knicks now have won four in a row, so they're starting to get things going here, which is looking good. You know, they're actually playing some defense, which is nice. Now, Jalen Brunson is injured, but hopefully that's not a serious injury, but maybe they're starting to turn it around a little bit. But, yeah, and the one other thing I would say I would watch here with sports as we um, – I almost bid you adieu here, um, as the in terms of the hockey, Hank is you know Alex Ovechkin's going for eight hundred career goals. I know, I know he's a rival to us, but I, I don't care. I love watching the guy. Like it's he's any hard. any athlete like that you've watched for like a good amount of your life. You keep appreciating the older he gets and the older you get because you never know how much more amazing or how many more amazing accomplishments you're going to see out of said player and. The fact that he's kept it up for so long, it's absolutely unreal. Probably, I don't want to say the closest I've seen to, like, a Gretzky, but Ovechkin's in his own. All these legends are in their own class. I don't really like making the comparisons. Right. and I know, feel like comparisons one, are disrespectful. And all with one team, too. So that'll be something to watch here in the coming days. Well, we're just about to put a wrap on not only this episode, but all of our shows here for 2022. So before we go, you know, it's been 36 shows here of Game On since we started day one back in, I think it was like March 15th or so. Uh, Hank, Nick, Hank, I'll start with you. One, what was probably your favorite sports moment of this year? I think I know what your I know what your favorite is, but for all of us, what was your favorite moment for this year? For me, for yeah. me or Nick, um, yeah. this one, well. I'm going to, before I say my favorite, I'm going to give an honorable mention. And that was Aaron judge breaking the record and hitting 62 home runs. Cause that was pretty cool from a historic standpoint to see arguably the real home run record. We're not going to have this debate today. That could be for another episode get broken, but definitely nice to see it happen as a result of a Yankee legend. So that's my honorable mention, but what you might ask, could I possibly be putting ahead of Aaron Judge? Could it be a certain blue hockey team that I talk about that often has given me gray hairs in years past? <laughs> well, if you know me, then you know that that would happen to be true. This was by far, the past season was by far one of, if not, I could even argue it was the, my favorite Rangers team that I had watched in my lifetime. I mean, Everyone likes to talk about how, oh, they came out of nowhere, made the playoffs, and while I'm probably – was probably among the minority who thought that they would at least maybe get there win a playoff series because I knew how good the roster and how talented it was. Let's put a few things in perspective. That – the Rangers won like 50 games. They were only two or three wins short of what was their franchise record for most wins – and they were also pretty close to their record for most points in a season in Rangers history. You had great se- an amazing season from Igor Shosturkin, who you could argue had, had had a better single season than Henrik Lundqvist did in his 15-year career as the Rangers backstop. And then, of course, you also had emergence of Adam Fox. You had Chris Kreider having a 50 goal season. That's only been done three times by a Ranger that be those players being Yarmir Yager, Adam Graves and Vic Hadfield. And of course we got to get into the playoff run where it seemed like they had no business winning that series against the Penguins. They're down three games to one. And in the next three games, they were all trailing at some point that had never happened before in a three, one comeback until the Rangers did that. And, uh, on a personal note, I am extre- feel extremely blessed. I had the pleasure of being at 30 regular, well, 34 regular season games. We count the four games that were on the road. So I went to one in Boston, one in Philadelphia, and two in New Jersey. And then I was at every single playoff game. And by far being at game seven when Panarin scored that goal, I have never seen the garden louder. Because keep in mind, I wasn't around in 94 and – I didn't get, I was still in high school, so I was not around able to see any of the games in person during that Henrik Lundqvist near miss era. So Mm -hmm. that was really cool. And then even more surprising was when they beat Carolina in the second round. They were 
down two games to none. But yet, even in those games they lost, I still didn't have a sense that it was over because I still thought the Rangers essentially looked like the better team. And that was proven to be true as they went, went on to win that series in seven. And then against the Lightning. Now, that series, of course, was a heartbreaker. I still get stung anytime I think of Ryan Strom missing that empty net. But let's be honest, Ryan Strom was not playing at 100% full health. And, you know, the fact that they even gave the Lightning such a scare and the Lightning were coming off back-to-back Stanley Cup runs. I don't care that they that those Cup, Cup Finals wins happened in weird circumstances because of the pandemic. You still had a pretty – that was still a pretty damn talented roster that the Rangers were facing. And as sad as it was that I traveled all the way down to Florida to see Game 6 happen – it still was such a crazy, unforgettable roller coaster ride of a Ranger season that I had not enjoyed in quite some time. This year, obviously, they're having their ups and downs. I think roster wise, I still think roster wise, they're a better team. But as I said, when they were like, you know, struggling, we could have a very different conversation. And what do you know? They're on a four game win streak. Now, what happens the rest of the season? That remains to be seen. But I think the Rangers are definitely have the horses and I don't mean to sound delusional. I still pretty much think they're capable of making a deep run and Hey, maybe they get Patrick Kane at the trade deadline. That could very well be the, be a key piece that leads them over the top. And um, yeah, you, you knew I had to say the 2022 Rangers playoff run, even if it didn't quite end the way I was hoping to, but I have a lot of hope for the next few years. Uh, that's absolutely fair. And, you know, just to piggyback off of that, that was one of the great things about this show was that we were pretty much following them along Mm -hmm. week in and week out there in May and June. It was, uh, it was a heck of a ride and hopefully we'll be able to do that again next year. And I still think they have the potential to do that because we've learned in hockey that, you know what, sometimes it doesn't matter how you start and the devils have been off to a phenomenal start, but you know, as you come down the stretch here and you get hot and then you get into the playoffs and you get a right matchup and your goaltender plays really well, you have a chance. So that's that is why I think the Rangers will still mm-hmm. be all right here as long as they find their form. I mean, Igor, I know he gave three goals yesterday, uh, and I should say on Monday night, but he had some unbelievable stops there, and he still has two. Yeah, even then, Igor was still a big reason why we won that game. Like, if yeah. it wasn't for him, we would have that game would have been over probably early in the second period. And Again, I'm I'm more than happy to give you my perspective, the perspective from a season ticket holder for the course of 2023. Should Absolutely. be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Nick, you got some news before you want to go? Yeah, well, one, I just want to say this show, talk about favorite moments for a second. Getting this show off the ground for the beginning of the year uh, on this network. Now, Johnny, you and I connected. It was a long time since we had connected. Uh, and I just said, oh, I'm looking for a new sports show. Let me give him a, a call or a message. And then we started talking, and then the show came together, and we started working on it. And then I asked you, we got to find somebody, because i running around doing all the other shows. And I said, right. you know what? And I, and I started listening to Hank, and I said, he's good. Let's go see if we can get him on the show. He he could be a great guest. And I, then you guys did the baseball, and I'm like – this is great, and now we got a great show. Um, Absolutely, I would, and I would also say the greatest sports moment. I, I biased or not, I think Aaron Judge hitting sixty two was the the pinnacle of the year, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of other great moments. I know there's a lot of great things that happened this year, but history is history, mm-hmm. and uh, how you look at it. So for me, that would be my favorite moments of the year, mm-hmm. uh, in my opinion. And there are many more to come in twenty twenty three. Before we get to the news, what Johnny, why don't you give yours first, and we'll finish off with a, a well, bang, so to speak. Yeah, sure. So it a, a favorite personal moment? I mean, it's hard to pick one because, I mean, there was so many. I mean, I almost would even say, you know, you want to talk about baseball, Albert Pujols' 700th was pretty remarkable, all things mm-hmm. told, what he's been through. But there's just so many, and I think that's why I have to say my favorite moment of 2022 has been, and this show is documented, has been – how nonstop it seems like every single week in the sporting world was in 2022. When we first started the show back in March, we were talking about the free agent frenzy in terms of the NFL quarterbacks that were going, you know, Brady coming out of his 39 day retirement, going back to Tampa, Russell Wilson going to 
the Broncos and all the changes that have been going that were going on. And from that point on, it just took off because then you had March Madness happen. Then you had, you know, the baseball. We were still just coming out of the lockout, and we had that free agent frenzy uh, in baseball that lasted a week or two. And then that's when we had Hank on to discuss right before the season started, and then he he came in on board as a co-host. But you think about that, then you had the NBA playoffs, you had the Stanley Cup playoffs, you had, uh, you know, NFL offseason still going on. Uh, the baseball trade deadline, which we did that live show for the NFL draft, which was we didn't know exactly what direction our two teams were going to go in. It turns out both of ours, I think, had a very, very good draft. And we're seeing that pan out this season. And then just once you get in the football season, you know, it takes sports, you know, either radio or in our case, podcasting to a whole nother level. And that's what we've been able to do. So 15 weeks into the football season, it's just been absolutely remarkable. The college football season, which I think this year was kind of different than in years past because you're going into a college football playoff this year that has no Clemson and no Alabama, which is extremely rare in all the games. And I, I forget, I think it was Heather Dinich on, on ESPN, who's an excellent uh, college football analyst and reporter had said that of all the, I think it was like 24 out of 32 college football playoff games have either featured the likes of Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama. And two of those three teams are not going to be in the final four that's are not in the final four this year, which is just remarkable. So to pick a favorite moment is so difficult. I'd say the moment would just be talking about all of this because it's just been so much. And that is why we are in our final show of the year going to go north of two hours here because it's just been that remarkable. And I think this show to wrap it all up has been absolutely remarkable. So that would be it. And it's been great to you know, I was on a bit of a hiatus. I used to do radio and now transforming into here has been remarkable. So uh, we will see what 2023 has in store for us. I think, you know, as the NFL is so unpredictable this year that I think it could really just be a last team standing that could be making it into uh, January and February. And then, you know, the basketball we'll see, the hockey we'll see. And then before you know, it, it'll be March Madness and, and baseball. So that's what we'll have to look forward to. And just to, uh, document what we were talking about at the start of the show it has been uh reported and confirmed that kyler murray did tear his acl so obviously out for this season and we'll see now how long it lingers into next season because it is the middle of december and i don't think you would come back that quick from a torn acl there was a doctor i think that was tweeting last night that it's usually like at the bare minimum like 10 months so that would put you into October, November, and then who knows, you know, getting yourself back into game shape could very well be at least half, if not most, of 2023 there for the Cardinals. So I think he might miss the season. I think he might miss the season. And that is why when I said at the start here, I think, you know, Jacoby Brissett, uh, Baker Mayfield, the, those kind of quarterbacks, your stopgap guys for next year are going to have to be the answer there in Arizona, which is just going to be a mess when you look at that whole entire division. So just uh, an awful start. They might have to – they they might have to overpay Kyler. Uh, excuse me, overpay Jacoby to to come in there. Well, they've already are spending so much on Murray, so I don't know if they want to do that with a second guy. That will be that'll be something to watch though, because you know what? It'd be very. Uh, those are the kind of quarterbacks that are going to go over there. You know, dare I say, you know, the Trubisky's of the world. I mean, that that's one thing. You know, those kind of guys now have getting get jobs because the backup is pretty important when you look at the long season that the NFL is now with the extra game and stuff and the way that these guys get hurt. So good we'll, point. we will find out, but that just about puts a bow on 2022 for us here at game on. Now, this won't be the last time you see all of us here on game on because the next two weeks we will be doing best of. So all those moments that I was just telling you about mm -hmm. that we had, we're going to look back at them over the next two weeks here on the show. And of course, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ETP network, if there's any of the breaking stories that come out, you may see me doing a Monty moment. Our next scheduled Monty moment in terms of the college football stuff is going to be at the end of the year when we look ahead to the college football playoff semifinals. But this also will not be the last time that you see the three of us this week. Hank and myself will both be joining Nick Morganson and Tom Obano for episode, what is it, 166 of Empty the Bench? That'll be happening on yep, Wednesday. Yeah, it's the last. Yeah, the last uh, yeah. <laughs> live episode for Empty the Bench this year will be happening. And so Nick came on with us. We're going to join them. And 
you thought we had a lot to talk about on this show. Well, we got so much more that we didn't even get into this one that we're going to get into on that one. So that comes up Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And then the four of us will be back later on in the week for our Week 15 football picks against the spread, which should be very, very interesting. Hank and I hopefully will have a winning week. We both struggled last week, but still right in the hunt uh, as we come down the stretch here. So we are wrapping up 2022 in style, guys. That's for sure. Uh, longest show of the year. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? There's so much going worth on. It. It worth it. It only made sense, yeah. right? Absolutely. It's worth it. So, and by the way, I forgot to mention this before, but I do want to thank both of you guys for bringing me on board for the show. This has been a lot of fun, and I cannot wait to see what 2023 brings into the fold. Yeah. Absolutely, Hank. Definitely. You've been a great addition as well. And um, I know everybody that I, I talk to, down here uh likes all of us uh likes our team work together you and i likes nick likes tom and looks likes nick as well all of our shows and uh we in some ways we're still just getting started so again we will see you wednesday at three for uh episode 166 of game on of, of empty the bench excuse me and then we'll be back on friday for our football friday picks and then back for our uh best ofs and you will see some monty moments and some more uh, NFL pick. So again, the best way to do subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ETB network. So, you know, when of our stuff's coming out. So for Nick Morrison and Hank and Dictor, I'm Johnny Montepano. Everybody have a safe, happy, and healthy holiday. We'll see you throughout. And then we will see you back for episode 37 in 2023. Have a safe and happy health, happy and healthy holiday and a happy new year, everybody. We'll see you later.